Good day. My name is Ton de Boer, and I will be chairing this day. I'm the chair of the Medicines Evaluation Board, and I'm really glad that we have again our yearly Medicines Evaluation Board Science Day. You remember last year we had the pharmacoepidemiology 25 years and the year before that animal experiments. And this year it's about academic drug development. Uh, we hope to stimulate and also strengthen uh, academic drug development. Uh, it's good to know that um, more than 460 participants are there online. Um, and uh, when you look at the mix of it, more than 100 from academia, more than 90 participants from industry, and also 120 regulators. So that's a good mix, I think, for this day. Uh, important, I think we have a very nice program, that you can uh, ask questions during the presentations by using the chat on your computer. Uh, it's also possible to have contact with other participants. Therefore, you have to go to networking, and then you can chat or even have a video call with other participants. But he or she has to, open, uh, has to be open for calls. Um, let's now start the program. And we start with uh, Paula Lukemeyer. Paula Lukemeyer is the executive director of the Medicines Evaluation Board, and she started May 2021. Uh, after studying pharmacy in Leiden, and was trained as a pharmacist in Utrecht, she worked uh, for several years at the MEB already, as an assessor. Uh, but for the past 20 years, she had held different management positions at various governmental agencies, but we are happy she's now back at the MEB, where she started her career. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to this year's MEB Science Day. My name is Paula Lukemeyer. In May last year, like Tom told you, I've been appointed as the director of the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board. So this will be my first Science Day. Personally, I'm really looking forward to this meeting today about academic drug development. I will learn a lot about the subject myself today. Much has changed with regard to this subject since my previous working experience at MEB already 30 years ago. Academic drug development is a topic that is of high importance for the MEB. We reach out to academics by being involved in training of future Dutch clinical pharmacologists, teaching activities, and internships of various Dutch universities. And we participate in the EU-funded project on strengthening training of academia in regulatory science, also called STARS. Today you will hear more about the STARS project and the outcomes of this project. Apart from these actions, this MEB Science Day also gives us the opportunity to discuss how academic drug development and the road to registration and reaching the patients can be improved. I am looking forward to hearing the experiences from academics and actions taken by other initiatives, such as uh, the Future Affordable Sustainable Therapies Program from the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sports and the Ministry of Economic Affairs. All the information for, from today will also be taken into on board in our agency in order to improve the connection between research and regulation. I am very happy that we have such a large number of participants from different stakeholders, such as academics, regulators, patients' organizations, funders, and industry. Due to COVID-19, it's unfortunate that this event can't take place in person. On the other hand, the virtual world also makes it easier to cross borders. We have quite a number of participants from countries outside the Netherlands present as well. Later this year, we are planning to organize an event where we could meet in person, uh, focused on academics and small and medium-sized enterprises. Information on the needs mentioned today 
can also be taken into account with this future event. Therefore, I invite you to interact and participate actively today. I wish all of you a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, Paula already mentioned the STARS project, strengthening training for academia in regulatory science. Uh, at this meeting, Dr. Victoria Storek-Kosko will tell you more about this project. I think it's important to get to know a little bit more about that and why it is important for the MEB to contribute in it. Uh, Victoria um, studied pharmacy in Ukraine and Groningen and after a PhD at the University of Groningen, four years ago she started as a clinical assessor, assessor at the MEB. She has been involved with the STARS project from the start in 2019. Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ton, and also for this opportunity to be able to speak today and to present the journey of this very exciting project. So, as was already mentioned by uh, Paula and also Ton, that um, um, the ac academic contribution is not disputed to the drug discovery and development. But if earlier we saw academia mostly as a contributor to the drug discovery phase, in the recent years, uh, its contribution to the translational clinical uh, phase of the development is uh, definitely increasing, especially in the field of uh, innovative medicine and adv advanced therapies. For example, in the study of De Wilde from 2016, uh, we could see that uh, uh, more than a half of the clinical trials initiated in Europe were initiated by academic partners and only a small percentage by large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, similar data were also seen in the um, uh, FDA uh, applications uh, for uh, marketing authorization, uh, where more than a half of the applications uh, con uh, um, con uh, continued this uh, um, uh, constituted this uh, uh, contribution of academic uh, partners. Uh, but uh, despite this fact, we see that uh, even though contribution of academia in the phase two, phase three trials uh, is uh, very large, uh, academic drug developers have difficulty to pursue this translational journey to later stage of clinical trials. And uh, this fact is known as a translational gap yeah, between uh, the developments and uh, the clinical practice. And uh, it's called in the literature Valley of Death. And um, the reasons uh, for, um, for this translational gap between uh, developments and practice, clinical practice, may be various. It may be due to uh, science itself, due to difficulty in manufacturing process, uh, due to financial uh, hurdles, uh, but also regulatory hurdles uh, are known to play sometimes detrimental role for some of the projects. And specifically on this aspect we are focusing today. And with this uh, also uh, in mind, with these hurdles in mind, the challenges academia are facing, the STRAS project was initiated uh, in, uh, in Europe in 2019. This project uh, consists of 21 partners from 18 European countries, so it's very large European coverage. Uh, and uh, it was initiated with a primary goal to reach uh, uh, academic developers early in the translational uh, research, to uh, transfer, to increase the regulatory knowledge, and uh, by in this way uh, to improve the regulatory impact and uh, the contribution to the clinical practice of the results obtained from this project. But of course, the STARS project is not about the regulators getting together and uh, discussing what to do uh, and what is the best for academia. Of course, we have to sit uh, at the table, at the round table, together with main stakeholders uh, in the arena. It's the uh, funding bodies, uh, industry, academia itself, obviously, but also patient representatives. And all the STARS activities were focused uh, uh, primarily to reach the primary goal of the project, is to reach the needs of academia. But uh, of course, in order to reach the needs of academia, we need to understand uh, what are those needs and what challenges academic drug developers are facing. 
And uh, in order to do that, in the STARS project, we uh, sent out a uh, force service to the main stakeholders, uh, uh, to the main stakeholders uh, in, uh, in this environment, so academia itself, funding organization, and regulatory authorities, to inquire uh, what, in their view, are the main challenges that academia are facing. But before I show you the results of this uh, survey, I would like to have a look at the result that you provided uh, in the chat. Um, so, yeah, okay. Um, uh, I will go directly uh, through the, to, the, uh, to the results of our STAR service, because that's why I'm here, to show you the results of this, uh, of this project. Um, uh, so, yes, um, what we saw uh, with the results of this survey is that there are already a large uh, number of activities available on national but also European levels for academic drug developers starting from very informal interactions with regulators uh, uh, and uh, uh, ending with uh, quite formal, for example, scientific advice or other regulatory support tools. But what we also saw that only a small part of, the, um, of their uh, responders were aware, especially of the research groups, were aware about these activities. Uh, for example, about scientific advice, it is considered uh, to be uh, one of the most prominent, I think, support tools available for uh, drug developers. Only half uh, uh, of their respondents were aware about the possibility to get an advice. And also, uh, what was also interesting to see that um, um, uh, the uh, support tools that were primarily uh, targeting very innovative advanced therapy projects such as uh, Prime Scheme at the uh, EMA or uh, Innovation Task Force meetings, for example, only a very small percentage of drug developers were aware about these support tools. Uh, among other challenges that researchers uh, named uh, uh, were um, a poor communication of academic researchers with, uh, uh, with uh, drug developers. And uh, uh, this was uh, seen as uh, 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 the interaction was deemed to be poor uh, due to time constraints, uh, due to uh, language barrier, but also that the high bar of this type of support, so the researchers felt that it's difficult to reach the regulators on more informal level. Uh, also, uh, the difficulty to reach a proper level of regulatory knowledge in academic, in, uh, academic uh, researchers was also mentioned as one of the uh, challenges, especially clinical trial applications were mentioned uh, and also initiation of first in human clinical trials. And another challenges such as time and also uh, complexity of the whole regulatory system were mentioned as well. So in, uh, in this in mind, and all these gaps in mind, the challenges that were named by the, uh, by the researchers, we uh, try to design our further STARS activity to address those gaps and those challenges. And uh, we started uh, our journey, uh, STARS journey also continued, I would say, our STARS journey with uh, uh, launching a comprehensive inventory on the STARS website. This inventory includes uh, different support tools available for academia from profit but also non-profit organization um, that are available in different European countries. And you can sort it by area of uh, expertise or uh, type of advice that can, they can provide or by country. And it's currently published uh, on the STARS website. You could see the link here and also QR code. Um, and uh, it's a living document, so it will be continuously updated to include maybe new sources of uh, um, of this support. Uh, next, of course, we had to sit together with all the stakeholders at the round table and discuss, uh, to exchange our views and discuss what is actually the most important aspect when we talk about communication uh, of regulators with academia. And uh, I think all the stakeholders uh, were of the opinion that bi-directional communication is actually the primary goal that we have to reach. So it's not about regulators translating regulatory knowledge to academia, but it's also getting a feedback from academia in order for regulators is to improve the regulation, to tailor their support to academic uh, developers and, uh, uh, and uh, improve communication uh, as a whole. Uh, the next uh, step in the STARS projects were uh, organizing pilot activities. And uh, within STARS, we have uh, three, organized three pilot activities and uh, three pilots. And these pilots were um, aiming to address the main gaps that we identified uh, also within the, our STARS consortium. So it's uh, to uh, improve the regulatory knowledge 
uh, of academia, uh, academic drug researchers, and also to see how we can improve communication uh, with uh, um, academic researchers. And the first uh, pilot project where MEB also took an active part together with our colleagues from Czech Republic is to organize a teaching activity. It was a three days course where we uh, covered uh, um, uh, most general regulatory topics uh, about the regulatory uh, uh, framework in Europe and also national level. And uh, uh, we discussed uh, uh, some basic regulatory knowledge on the de drug development um, uh, program, starting from quality, non-clinical, clinical, and post-marketing uh, post issues that uh, developers can encounter. And uh, this uh, course was specifically targeted to academia in uh, three recipient countries. It's uh, Hungary, Austria, and Italy. And uh, the presentation of this course are also currently published on the STARS website, so you could also uh, have a look at it if you are interested. And what we saw that this course was re really well received, more than 90% of the participants really appreciated this type of information and they said that this type of courses should be organized more often. Uh, with the second pilot activity within the STARS project, we try to see how we can improve to communication with, uh, with uh, academic developers. How to, can we lower the bar uh, and uh, improve also the time frames uh, uh, within which we communicate with academic developers. And it was organized by one uh, stop shop platform on the Spanish agency in this case. Uh, and uh, it all, this platform contained relevant information for academic drug developers, uh, not only uh, useful links or, um, or uh, uh, documents or guidelines, but also there was a communication page, communication board page, where uh, drug developers could ask a question to regulators and get an, a, a bit informal answer within a short period of time. And also they could also provide a feedback on the certain guidelines, uh, for example, for uh, regulators as well. So more information also on this pilot project uh, you could find also on the STARS website. And also in this case, uh, the um, level of uh, uh, the low threshold uh, uh, communication in this case and uh, fast response time were really also appreciated by uh, drug developers. Um, but of course, uh, just organizing a, a three days course in this case um, for academia, it will not improve, uh, it will not sustain the improvement of, uh, of uh, uh, regulatory knowledge in drug developers. For that, it would be the best, of course, to integrate uh, the regulatory science knowledge, the regulatory science part in the curricula of already existing bachelor and master programs for biomedical and uh, pharmacy students. Uh, so, in, in with this respect, uh, uh, in the, within the STARS project, we uh, drafted a co-curriculum uh, for universities and uh, academic institutes to consider of implementing it uh, into the already existing curricula for master and bachelor students in order to already prepare and improve future translational researches in uh, regulatory science. And also within the STARS consortia, we uh, um, drafted also a comprehensive curriculum that is more meant as a postgraduate course, postgraduate pro uh, program, with more in-depth knowledge on different aspects of regulatory science, starting from clear quality, non-clinical, clinical part, but also uh, post-marketing uh, post experience and, uh, and different issues. And uh, this course also um, uh, ideally should be organized, of course, with um, collaboration with the regulators and uh, uh, be provided as a postgraduate course uh, for those who are interested in more in-depth uh, knowledge on specific aspects. And uh, of course, uh, we uh, don't want to, uh, uh, to end the journey here. Uh, we want, uh, even uh, when the STARS project uh, has ended, uh, we would like to see some progress uh, that we uh, have achieved maybe with this, uh, or initiated uh, with, this, uh, with this initiative. And uh, for that, uh, the STARS consortium is uh, currently uh, busy writing a um, stakeholder uh, um, and, and a, a strategy paper. Uh, and this strategy paper is aimed to draft uh, core recommendations for 
uh, different stakeholders in this arena, so for industry, for academia, for regulators, and it's directed to the European Commission to consider to be implemented in the uh, coming years. So the initiation, the activities that we initiated within these three years of STARS project can continue afterwards as well. And uh, of course, uh, our uh, ultimate goal is to close this translational gap, to get rid of the uh, term Valley of Death, and to turn this uh, project, academic project, to uh, success stories. So I think this uh, should be a primary uh, goal uh, that also we want to um, achieve today as well. And uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, all the STARS consortium partners. It's a big team that was working on this project uh, uh, for the past three years. And of course, to the European Commission for uh, funding the, this project as well. And, and thank you for your attention and uh, would be happy to get any questions. Victoria, thank you very much for your nice presentation. It's good to get knowledge of this project. Um, and uh, I was looking whether there are questions in the chat. And uh, well, let's start with the first one. Uh, can you tell if the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board provides training sessions to pharmaceutical, medical and academic drug developers? Yes, surely. So I'm happy to say this, <laughs> to, to give this answer. Uh, so um, MEB provides uh, active trainings to uh, clinical pharmacologists in training. Uh, so we give also our, uh, uh, necessary knowledge. We uh, talk about how we assess also uh, how the dossier for a drug looks like, how we assess it, and also what are important aspects to consider when developing a drug. And also uh, different uh, um, uh, employee, uh, employers of, uh, uh, employees of uh, MEB also give uh, lectures at the academia and uh, universities because we have sometimes uh, combined positions where we provide uh, lectures also on regulatory science uh, to uh, bachelor and master students. Okay, uh, I look there. Uh, where can we find the comprehensive curriculum for healthcare professionals? Is it already there? Yes, so a comprehensive inventory is already launched uh, and uh, it's on the STARS website. So, um, well, you could uh, have a look, uh, of course, uh, back and see a QR code uh, that you can scan on also uh, go to the STARS website. But if you just Google the name of the STARS project and on the STARS web website, you can go to the uh, comprehensive curricula and you can see by country and... Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, called maybe comprehensive curriculum, but as I said, it's a living document. Uh, and also, maybe it's a, also a call for organizations that provide this type of support, even if they are universities or for-profit organization or non-profit organization, to get in contact, and we will include them also to this uh, website. Okay, so I think that's a good answer. And, well, important, I think, in your lecture is that uh, academia has to learn how regulators are talking. Um, I, I uh, recognize that when I started. I remember all kind of abbreviations, and I remember one, O-H-E. I thought, what's that kind of abbreviation? <laughs> That's the orange hand envelope. Yeah. <laughs> so, And it takes quite some time to get... To, I, I'm coming from academia to learn how regulators talk and yeah. communicate. And, yeah. and uh, so I think it's very important to be trained. And even if you're working there, it still remains very difficult. Yeah. So many procedures and things which are there. Yeah, so sure. it's very relevant. Yeah. Yes, and I think also here, maybe uh, also, of course, academia, maybe have to uh, learn some of the regulators' terms, but it's very important that regulators will speak a clear, plain language, actually, without regulatory jargon. So actually, to speak in the language of academia, I think we can do it very well. So it's also a message, yeah. I think, to all of us. We all come from academia. Eh? Yeah, the we come from academia. Yeah. Almost uh, all of yeah. uh, regulators yeah. come yeah. from academia, and they did also research in the past, or still continue doing it. So it's, I think, very important to keep in mind that... Uh, very good. It's, it's vice versa. Yes. Um, what did you learn as a regulator of, in, of your interaction with academia? Um, as a regulator, because, well, I also uh, did uh, five years of uh, academic research before I uh, came at, uh, to work at my PhD yeah. and also a postdoc. Uh, so, of course, I already had insights in the academic world, but of course, with now collaborating so much with really translational research from the uh, from academic side, 
I think uh, we uh, see what uh, what is upcoming, so we could see uh, what type of maybe uh, uh, guidelines of what we need to tailor in our regulatory system actually to address the upcoming technology, novel and uh, cutting edge technologies. So uh, I think this gives uh, us also a, a crucial insight in uh, what needs to be adapted maybe from a regulatory point of view to feed the needs uh, of uh, new developments. Okay. This was really a European project. I was, I'm wondering, uh, did you learn something about, uh, when you look at different countries, what is the ranking of, uh, well, let's say, collaboration between academia and regulatory agencies when you look in Europe? Is the Netherlands still low or are they high when you compare it with other countries? Um, I think it's uh, maybe on a high level, but maybe not the highest due to, I think, the scattered um, um, uh, aspects, I think, of regulatory environment in the uh, in, uh, uh, in Netherlands. For example, if clinical trial applications, uh, CBG is not doing it, yeah, MEB is not doing it, it's doing CCMO, for example. In other countries, it's more combined in one place. So then you see academic developers much earlier than we do because they came, for example, for first in human uh, trial applications. And also some of the regulatory agencies, uh, like Spanish regulatory agency or Italian regulatory agency, they are also sponsors, and so they are uh, funding bodies as well. So they sponsor clinical research in academia, and then also you get yeah, much more in touch, of course, with, uh, with yeah. those developments. Yeah. In the okay. Netherlands, it's also a little bit different. But uh, I think at MEB, with regulatory science, we are on a very high level also providing trainings, especially in providing trainings that we saw that the Netherlands is one of the uh, yeah, top countries to, uh, to do that. Very yeah. good. Thank you. I'm looking. Oh, there are no other questions in the chat. Um, um, scientific advice. Yeah? Uh, you, you mentioned that, and I... I remember that 50% of the academic um, uh, people who work at academia know that you can have a scientific advice yeah. while they're busy, I assume, with drug development. How can that be? How um, this, this gap in uh, that we think, uh, we, we call it in Dutch, advice op maat, mm -hmm. you can go to the MEB and uh, ask questions there. Uh, how can it be that this is still quite unknown, what the possibilities are? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think we really uh, need to try to address that question uh, as well. Um, I think the media channels, of course, how we advertise this type of activities needs to be improved. So we need to um, uh, maybe uh, uh, couple a little bit better link to the innovation offices at the universities, for example, to say, okay, we can provide these activities, please also spread the word. Yeah, so uh, during, uh, of course, we cannot approach every single clinical research at the academia, but we can do it by uh, approaching uh, technology transfer offices, for example, or innovative offices at the academia, and then they can uh, already instruct or maybe give advice to their uh, researchers at the certain uh, clinical center, for example. So, Okay, yeah, let's have a look now. Yeah. Um, Victoria, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. and. Uh, we go to the next speaker. Yes, thank, thank you very much. much. Okay, in the next presentation, uh, Dr. Marion Pasmoy will tell you more about the possibilities for drug development support at the national and also at the European level, uh, which are at this moment in place. Um, Marion Pasmoy, uh, she did her PhD uh, at the University Medical Center in Groningen. And she, for a long time, combined her academic career in the field of rare diseases with her work at the Medicines Evaluation Board. Uh, and since 2018, she had a career switch. Uh, she's the head of the science office at the MEB. And she is actively involved also in the STARS project. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom, for this uh, introduction. So today I will tell you all about the possibilities of having uh, scientific advice at a European and uh, at the national level. So at the European level is at the European Medicines Agency, at the national level is focused here in my presentation on the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board. I would also like to ask you, there is a question in the chat from this morning, of this morning, from the beginning. Um, to answer that question as well, because later um, we will uh, present those answers in a word cloud. So, why would you go for scientific advice? 
Um, a study of Hover et al. showed that if you go for scientific advice to the regulatory agencies and you implement this advice in your drug development program, and then subsequently you submit your product for marketing authorization, if you have been compliant with that advice, you have a higher chance of getting your product approved and also to the patient. So that's why it is important to have this advice from the regulatory agencies and also um, to implement it in your program. I would like to start with a different type of support services that are there at the European Medicines Agency and later on I will tell about the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board. And they're displayed on this slide that will be coming back during my presentation. So the first one is the Innovation Task Force meetings. Uh, those are free of charge and they provide a discussion platform for early dialogue with the regulators. As you can see on the right hand side of the slide, in 2020, 27 of those meetings have been taken place and 11 out of 27, so 41% were initiated by academic developers. Those innovation task force meetings, as the name already indicates, are about innovative methods and innovative technologies. So 30% concerned innovative methods to support the development of medicines and the 22% uh, regarding manufacturing technologies. So this can be the first uh, step um, to have a meeting with the regulators already early on. The other possibilities are to go for scientific advice. It was already mentioned before in the presentation of Victoria Starokosko and uh, by Ton de Boer. Uh, and then you go for more specific advice on the appropriate tests and studies that you need for the development of your medicine. And one of the possibilities is this prime scheme, which is uh, more regular advice with the regulators, but that's only uh, in place for products with a high unmet medical need. Also, it's possible to qualify novel methodologies, uh, for instance, uh, for a biomarker. So, to give you an idea these, um, about the scientific advices and the numbers uh, that are uh, taking place, um, in 2020, there were 787 scientific advices. And so that's about 60 each month uh, by the scientific advice working party from the European Medicines Agency. And you have also 143, that is protocol assistance, and that's specifically focused for rare diseases. On the right hand side, uh, you can see the scientific advices that are in place for these prime products. So there are more, reg more frequent meetings for products with this high unmet medical need. So that's, uh, you have to qualify for that. And those were 37 in 2020. And also the uh, uh, qualification meetings of novel methodologies, such as biomarkers, there were 15 in 2020. Also in this figure, you can see advice that is sometimes given together with the HDA. That's about reimbursement com combining with regulatory for getting the approval. And also uh, together with the international regulators, such as the FDA. So um, it was already mentioned in the chat, I think, um, by Marcel Kent, there's a huge number of uh, guidelines. But those guidelines are there to help you um, to develop your product. There are guidelines regarding quality, uh, non-clinical animal studies, and clinical, and sometimes also specific for a disease. So what the regulators also do in those scientific advice meetings is guide you through the uh, guidelines and help you uh, indicate which are relevant for your product. Going back to the slide previously, there are specific frameworks for pediatric development for medicines in children or for medicines, and to help to develop those uh, medicines uh, specifically uh, for, uh, for children and their diseases. So applicants can request scientific advice from the EMA in, in preparation of a pediatric investigation plan. And this is aimed to ensure that the necessary data are obtained uh, for studies in children. And such a, a scientific advice is free of charge. And they can also follow up such a pediatric investigation plan, for example, for a combined adult and pediatric development. So combining uh, adult and, and children in one study. For the rare diseases, in 2020, the EMA, um, when you have received an orphan designation for your medicinal product, um, for academia, uh, that develop such a medicine, uh, 
scientific advice is free of charge. Also to stimulate coming to the EMA and, and to stimulate uh, um, having this discussion. Then the last uh, one that I would like to mention, that is the uh, support for small, medium and enterprises, and which includes briefing meetings to discuss regulatory strategies, for instance, for advanced therapy medicinal products, and those are uh, gene and cell therapy products. Going from the European level of the possibilities of scientific advice to the national level, and then here focus on the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board. So maybe first of all, why when, why and when would you go to a European level and when to a national level? Now, national advice can be an important first contact point and then also can be a first step to subsequently ask for advice on a European level. The advantage on a national level is that we have face-to-face -face meetings, although during COVID there were then virtual face-to-face -face meetings, whereas at, at the European level a selection is made for which scientific advice a discussion meeting is held. Um, as I mentioned before, there are about 65 scientific advices each month, so a selection has to be made because not for all a discussion meeting can be held. We have, uh, since 2015, a specific type of advice, advice of math, uh, tailor-made scientific advice, which is aimed for uh, academia and small-medium enterprises, and that um, tailor-made scientific advice has also a reduction in the fee, uh, again, to stimulate academia and uh, uh, small companies, uh, uh, startup companies to come to the uh, MEB. I've displayed the uh, link on the website, but this, um, uh, the, the presentations will be also be made available after the meeting, and also the email address if you would like to know more about this type of advice. We did last year an analysis of this tailor-made scientific advice, or advice of math, and in the time frame of 2015, 2020, there were 47 accepted requests for tailor-made scientific advice. 15 of those were from academia, so 32%, 24 from small medium enterprises, and eight for, were for big pharma. I indicated that it is focused on academia and SME, but those big pharma were also accepted because it was COVID related and we want, really wanted to stimulate uh, uh, new medicines for COVID. So if you look over the time frame of those, um, those years, uh, so how many advice we have received each month, or uh, each year, sorry, then it was like uh, varying from one to only four per each year. And we know that there are many more uh, developments are going on in academia. So I would really like to welcome you to make use of this possibility. Also, what we saw was that eight out of 15 are about drug rediscovery products. So more than 50% are drug rediscovery. Later today, Professor Carla Hollack will also present her study on, um, on drug rediscovery in academia, and that academia plays also a very important role in this. So you will hear more about that, but our results um, do conquer uh, that, uh, that study as well. Then um, there is this pilot that is ongoing currently, uh, which I would like to mention and I would like to draw your attention to. So there is a support for not-for-profit organization, academia, to generate evidence on the use of an established medicine for new indication and then also subsequently or, uh, authorizing it or uh, getting it registered. Um, you can find more information on the EMA's website and sponsors wishing to seek that uh, scientific advice can fill in submission form as submitted, and the deadline is 28th of February. There is actually um, a webinar immediately after this meeting today. Unfortunately, it was not possible anymore to register, but uh, I've had contact uh, with the EMA, and it will, the recording will be made available. Um, so um, then you can still have a look at that. And uh, we have a regulatory science LinkedIn group uh, at the, at the uh, MEB, uh, which, and then we also will share this information. Then going back to the uh, scientific advice and analysis that we had done uh, on those 15 advices. So what type of questions were submitted by, uh, by academia? So it can really vary from quality questions on how the product is made to uh, preclinical or non-clinical um, about whether uh, animal studies are necessary or not, clinical about the study design, 
regulatory and also um, with SINS or Instituut Nederland, that's the HDA about reimbursement. And um, it's, it's, yeah, it varies like also from whether it's feasible to obtain uh, marketing authorization by academia, uh, but also for drug rediscovery products, uh, there are frequently also uh, issues uh, are mentioned or questions are asked about the reimbursement. So with this, I would like, I have presented you the possibilities to go for scientific advice, either at the European level, at the national level. And I would like to uh, urge you make use of those possibilities that are there to help you. And make also use of the support offices at your university or center, such as technology transfer offices. Uh, it was mentioned already earlier that there may be a difference in language. Uh, also, uh, we do use a lot of abbreviations, but don't let it stop you. And it's important to have this dialogue and really educate each other. And not only the academics, but also the regulators to, to speak a language that can be understood from both sides. And education is key to success. And uh, I would like to mention on my last slide uh, a consortium that we have uh, found with uh, five other partners the Central Committee on Research Involving Human Subjects, the University of Leiden, Dutch Association for Pharmaceutical Medicine, and the Dutch Association of Clinical Pharmacology and Biopharmacy. And in this consortium, we are developing a postmaster education for drug development. We have received funding that's really, really recently, the beginning of this year, to start with a first course, a pilot course on basic pharmacology. And uh, now you will hear also more about that. And we. Uh, aim to deliver that at the end of the year. And having said that, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, listening and uh, looking forward to questions. Rion, thank you very much for your nice presentation. There are questions in the chat, so let's start there. Um, if you are developing a new patient reported outcome and want to get that acknowledged, where do you have to go to? Now you can, uh, for a patient record an outcome, there's uh, qualification meetings for novel, method yeah, novel methodologies. That would be really, uh, a way to go. Um, it sometimes it depends also if you're really early on. It's sometimes already good to first get in contact with the regulators, because if it's the first time that you're doing it, when you, when you really want to have this meeting, or if you have to have a little bit more information, um, because what the regulators do in such meeting is that you ask a question, but you also present the information that you're already having and your, your proposal. So it's not that you ask the question and then the regulators are going to say, okay, this is, this is how you do it, but they comment also on your proposal. So that's also important to have already some information, because if you have, uh, are very early on, you will ask general questions and you will also get general answers. It. But those, uh, the qualification meeting for a novel methodology, that would, be, that would be the way to go. Okay, clear, I think. Uh, are regulators still independent if they develop drug plans with industry? That's an interesting one. Yeah. Now, so the uh, scientific advice is really formalized. Uh, there, there have been also reports uh, a few years ago, five years ago, and there were also asked questions related to this about being independent. And um, so uh, it, it is really like a formal meeting that they ask the question, but you can get also a formal answer. And it is also when the, um, there are, uh, it's also looked like which countries are in the, in the lead and, and which countries are doing the actual assessment when the product is going for marketing authorization as, uh, application. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if I'm developing a repurposed medicine, should I go to the EMA or the MEB? Yeah, it could be both. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, but, but I think, yeah, now, yeah, if you don't have, um, yeah, if you do not have so much uh, experience yet, it might be good to first contact the MEB, so we, so, yeah, so we can help you a little bit um, in, in how to navigate, but it, it both can be, both can be good, uh, go, bo both yeah. can be good options, yeah. Uh, we even know that some industry goes to different countries to yeah. ask the same questions yeah. <laughs> and yeah. to look at the differences. Or yeah, because um, yeah. now we are representing the national scientific advice, of course, at the MEB, but there are also um, at other uh, 
at, at the other countries, you also have the possibility to ask for a national scientific advice. And sometimes what developers are doing is that they ask uh, that they go to, through uh, to uh, uh, different agencies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's another question. Uh, thanks, Marion, for your valu yeah. valuable information. Two major European Commission funded drug repurposing initiatives will kick off later, building sustainable platform coordinated from the Netherlands to ETRIS. How does the MEP foresee interacting with these initiatives to improve investigative driven academic rediscovery? Yeah. Um, I can answer this question also by indicating that we uh, do also a lot of projects together with academia. And uh, if it's a research project, uh, then we are frequently in an advisory board, also to make sure that what is developed is in, in line with the uh, regulatory requirements. If it's then really uh, going to be more focused on a specific medicine, then it's going to have to go to the more formalized uh, uh, formalized procedure, such as scientific advice. That's really in line also what I previously mentioned with, with being independent. Um, so um, with these projects, that's yeah, that's important. Uh, yeah, yeah, get yeah, have to get in contact and to see how we can uh, um, align and what we can, how we can collaborate with that because we think it's an important topic. Can you tell a little bit more at at our national level uh, uh, about patients involved or HTA organization involved in scientific advice? Yeah. What are the possibilities there? Yeah. The, um, at international level, there's the possibility to ask for scientific advice either together with the CCMO, uh, uh, Central Committee on uh, yeah, Human, Human Subjects, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and also the um, HDA, that's Zorg Institute Nederland. So then you can have a combined advice of, of those. And also with the um, patient um, uh, involvement, we have started for scientific advice to include that also um, uh, during our scientific advice procedures. The EMA has already a long uh, uh, experience uh, with that and I think this week also a paper came out where also uh, it was measured what the effect was really of um, of having this patient involved and, and really improving the, uh, the answers that were given in the scientific advice procedures. Okay. I think a, a very important topic, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, because in the end it should be reimbursed the drug, and patients, it is, uh, uh, yeah. of course, for and the patient uh, to involve them in, in such Yeah, and personally, procedures. I have had also very good, uh, I have been a clinical assessor uh, for 10 years at the Medicine and Evaluation Board, and have been uh, at scientific advice meetings at the EMA, and the patient involvement there for the meetings that I was, was there was really, uh, was really contributing. Okay, there are other questions in the chat, if I can see them, they're not there yet. Um, uh, what I was also wondering, when you look uh, uh, from academia perspective, eh? well, you always hear drug development, it takes 10 years, uh, and they're often at the starting point, so mm -hmm. in a later phase we will go for scientific advice. How important is it to be already from the start uh, to get that contact? Yeah, I think it's very important because um, uh, mm, examples were mentioned that, for instance, if you really want to, to bring it to the patient, sometimes you have to go for uh, for patents. And then it's important to not publish your results yet, because otherwise you cannot uh, get a patent anymore. So it's really important, if you have that in mind, to think already, okay, how do I want to do this? And also, sometimes uh, companies have indicated that they might be interested in a program but then the results may not be reproducible or they have to do it again. Yep. And so then to maybe get a company involved to, to, to really uh, bring it further, then, um, yeah, then it's also more difficult to get them interested in it. Yep. Yeah, clear. And also uh, a last one I was mentioned was this, uh, was this Congress from K uh, KWF, a funding organization, and they indicated also, especially for the ATMPs, that sometimes it's already good to have this discussion with the HDAs, because those are very expensive treatments. So what will be the amount for re reimbursement, and can I also produce it for that amount? Because otherwise you have had a very long um, drug development program, but in the end, if it's not reimbursed, yeah, it's also not reaching the patient. 80,000 euros per quality, <laughs> something like that. There's another question. Um, does MEB also think about incentives for drug rediscovery? 
Ja, yeah, er is. And um, we are uh, participating also in the Regulatory Science Network Netherlands. And uh, the Regulatory Science Network Netherlands is together with um, the uh, Innovative uh, Medicines Association and also with uh, uh, academic groups from the University of Groningen and, um, uh, um, and Utrecht and Holland Bio and, and with patient representatives. And there we have received funding from FAST. Um, and uh, two topics are very important in that. That is the rare diseases and the uh, drug rediscovery and also to think about other uh, incentives or other methods to really bring that forward, because that's also really what FAST, but uh, Dr. Sako de Visser will tell more about Thank it uh, this yeah. afternoon, will do. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, sometimes companies ask for scientific advice in different countries. Is there some kind of alignment within the EU about this? There is, um, from the, there's an EU innovation network from the HMA and the, uh, so all the heads of medicines agency, all the national agencies and the EMA, and uh, all the scientific, so the, all the uh, ways where you can ask for scientific advice in the national uh, um, uh, countries. And there they have also the simultaneous national scientific advice so that you also, uh, a company or an applicant can go uh, have the scientific advice with a couple of countries at the same time. Yeah, yeah. okay. Marion. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. An important topic, uh, scientific advice, how to get contact with that. And we go now to the next speaker. Okay, thank thank you. you. Okay, for the following two presentations, uh, we will learn from <coughs> two academics that are closely involved in academia pharma, academic pharma, uh, and their experience in that. Uh, and we will start now with the presentation of Professor Teun van Gelder, somebody I know very well already for years. He's now a professor in Leiden, after he was that in Rotterdam, and it's a professor in clinical pharmacology, drug discovery and drug development. That's very long, Teun, did you? <laughs> um, at Leiden University, um, since December 2019. He's one of the founders of the National Pharmaceutical Knowledge Center that was established in 2020. And he's also a member of the CCMO. Teun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ton, for the kind introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, in this uh, very interesting symposium, I will be representing uh, academia. And I would like to thank the organizers, especially Marian Pasmoy, for uh, inviting me to be here today. Uh, for the sake of completeness, I show you my disclosure slide. This is a, a very brief overview of the steps uh, within a drug discovery and development program. So we go from uh, basic science where new targets are identified or new compounds who are th that are being developed to translational research, the subsequent clinical studies and at the end the registration of a compound. And traditionally uh, the first part is taken care of by academia and the second part is taken care of by pharmaceutical industry. And on the far right hand side, you see the money which is involved in the early phase. The uh, investment is relatively small, but in the clinical phase, the investment is much, much uh, bigger. And with my presentation today, I hope to convince you that uh, academia should and can play a much bigger role in the clinical part as well and should even be able to bring drugs to registration. So uh, Ton already mentioned that about two years ago I moved to Leiden and uh, I think one of the really attractive parts of Leiden is that in Leiden the full drug development uh, ecosystem is there. There are many institutions that are representing the different parts of the drug development uh, trajectory and uh, I think this is a really attractive place uh, to work. Uh, on this slide you again see the different steps in the drug development uh, and I can easily show you which institution within a two kilometer circle around the Leiden University Medical Center would be able to take up all these parts of the uh, development. Um, 
Of course, I have to acknowledge that uh, in some situations this is happening in different institutions and I think we can still win by aligning these institutions in a much better way and make this a smooth uh, process. So um, um, I would like to show you the perspective of what is called the academic researcher. Of course, there are, are exceptions and this is a, a rather black and white situation, but I think it will be recognizable for most of you. Now, I think the academic researcher in general is focused very much on science, innovation and writing really nice publications that end up in top journals and not so much on, let's say, developing a drug and bringing it to registration. The focus of the academic researcher is usually on his or her own domain and not on a full development plan or a pipeline. Uh, and the risk, of course, of this approach is that after finishing a particular project, the interesting compound or the interesting target may end up on a shelf somewhere or in a drawer and else is not taken up for the next phase of a development program. And this leads to missed opportunities. Uh, and that's very sad because it will inhibit the development of a drug that becomes available for patients. Uh, it is sad because economic development is not uh, achieved. And therefore, I think it's important that as academic researchers, we realize that there are chances for us here. Um, if I talk with academic researchers about, uh, let's say, the procedures they have at pharmaceutical industry, where a full development trajectory is already defined at an early stage, then I sometimes feel resistance by these academic researchers because they would claim that academic freedom is very important for them and they are afraid that they are pushed in certain areas of research where they would not have their own uh, interest. And uh, I can assure you that uh, this is definitely not what academic pharma is trying to achieve. And I think this academic freedom is extremely important in finding these new targets and new uh, uh, compounds. And uh, furthermore, I think the awareness of academics on intellectual property or valorization in general is quite low. So the aim that we have with academic pharma is really high. We would really be able to achieve registration of drugs that are developed within academia. And I do realize that this is a very complex uh, area to work in. I do realize that for academia, the registration authorities will have the same criteria as for industry. Uh, still, I think it is something we can achieve. Um, another big problem, of course, in drug development is that, first of all, uh, the attrition rate of compounds that are in development is extremely high. And furthermore, that for some compounds, there is a lot of money involved in the development. And I am the first to acknowledge that it is not realistic that as academia, we will be able to have 800 million US dollars for the development of one particular compound. And I don't think it's very likely that we will be aiming for registration of, say, a new drug for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Because in this type of area, the drug trials that you need for a registration dossier are uh, involve thousands of patients. The cost that is involved in such trials is way too high for, let's say, academic researchers. And it is not likely that we will be able to bring such a compound to registration. Where we can make an important contribution is in the so-called valley of death. It has already been mentioned uh, earlier today. The valley of death is the, let's say, the transition from uh, late phase preclinical trials to early phase uh, human trials. And it is this uh, valley where many of these drugs uh, do not make it. And uh, I think uh, within academia, we do have a lot of knowledge already and we can learn from previous failures uh, by selecting uh, the right compound, by selecting the right experimental model, by selecting the right uh, endpoints. And I think this is something where the contribution of academia can be 
uh, very big. Uh, and I would also like to emphasize that even for the failures, it is very important that we publish our data and that we are able to learn from these uh, experiences. And unfortunately, these failures are not always uh, published. So uh, to give you a very nice uh, uh, example, uh, which is of course not a real life situation, but suppose an academic team has access to a compound that has an effect on ischemia reperfusion injury. And this particular compound has already been investigated in the field of myocardial ischemia, has ended up in phase two uh, and the development was stopped. And now the researchers have the idea to use this compound in kidney transplantation. So uh, in kidney transplantation, of course, a kidney is outside of the human body for uh, several hours, is then reperfused uh, in the recipient. And based on uh, clamping studies in a, in a rat model and on machine perfusion models uh, ex vivo, the investigators now would like to start a phase two study with the aim to demonstrate that this compound improves renal function at one week after transplantation and reduces the incidence of delayed graft function. So um, these investigators then end up at Academic Pharma and uh, in a discussion with the investigators, I would like to ask them what is the ultimate goal that you are aiming for. And uh, most likely these investigators will tell me, well, we are aiming to demonstrate efficacy of this drug and we would like to reduce the incidence of delayed graft function. They will probably not tell me we would like to make this a registered drug. It's probably not in their mindset uh, yet. If I ask them, is there a possibility to file a patent for this application or can you protect your intellectual um, idea on this, then most likely they will say, well, we have actually never considered doing this. Have you asked for a scientific advice? And again, um, I think uh, many of these academic researchers do not realize that this is a po possibility. Also because from the beginning, they were not really aiming to make this a registration uh, process. Um, an uh, idea on the total cost that would be involved to bring the drug to registration, for example, what sample size will you need in a phase three study and what would be the cost involved in this? Well, probably uh, at this early stage, they have not thought about it yet. And uh, if I then ask them, where should this money come from? Then maybe they ask me, well, maybe Academic Pharma can fund uh, our project, but for all the listeners today, um, I do not have a big bag of money where I can invest in new compounds, but I can help you in finding funding from other sources. Um, I have also uh, been involved in the uh, grant application, which is called Pharma NL at our national growth fund. Uh, with uh, researchers from uh, Leiden, Groningen, OS, and also the FAST uh, program. Uh, in Leiden, I think uh, uh, the focus on drug discovery and development is very strong. Both the University Leiden has a research program entitled Translational Drug Discovery and Development. And at the uh, Leiden University Medical Center, we have the program research theme, academic pharma. And of course, these two link uh, together very well. And um, the support from academic pharma to these uh, academic researchers is to increase the possibility of protecting intellectual property. We talk with these uh, researchers on whether to publish or not to publish their results, because if your data are in the a public domain uh, protecting your intellectual property will already be much more difficult. Uh, we recommend researchers to start with working with non-disclosure agreements if you involve uh, third parties. Uh, we also try to explain to academic researchers that it is a good idea to first start with what is your end goal? For example, do I want to make this a registered drug? and then think back, what do I need to reach this particular uh, end goal? And not 
let's say, first do haphazardly all sorts of studies and then only in the end ask yourself, is this what I need to, to do this? Um, the awareness of the impact of all sorts of regu regulatory issues is important. For example, in which laboratory am I going to do my tox toxicology studies? And um, the possibility for scientific advice is, of course, something that the uh, investigator needs to be aware of. And uh, also, as I said already mentioned, uh, in order to find funding, academic pharma can help. So what are we, we aiming at? Um, academic pharma is not aiming to develop so-called Me Too drugs, uh, variants of an already existing class of drugs. Um, this is not our uh, focus. We are also not focusing on the production of generic uh, formulations. Um, we first um, and uh, foremost uh, are looking for an unmet clinical need for which a drug needs to be uh, developed. And um, the most realistic uh, option for academic pharma is to work in the field of rare diseases. Uh, and we also uh, would accept compounds uh, for which a patent for a particular indication is not uh, possible. Um, new chemi chemical entities can be investigated, but also repurposing of existing drugs is a possibility. And um, a third category would be the pro protection of drugs which are already synthesized by pharmacies for smaller patient groups uh, who have the risk that they will be hijacked by uh, commercial parties after which uh, the price can sometimes increase uh, enormously. We have seen examples of this uh, in the past and there are also at present a number of compounds within academia that need uh, to be protected. And also here I see a role for academic pharma. Um, Sometimes people ask me, uh, is it going to happen in the next few years that on the Leiden Bioscience Park there is a new big building with academic pharma on the roof where trucks roll in and roll out that distribute drugs to, uh, let's say, uh, pharmacies or hospitals? Well, I do not think this is uh, going to happen. We do not have the ambition to become a large drug production uh, facility. Uh, if we would develop a drug with a registration which is indicated for a small group of patients, I think it will still be possible that we continue to produce this drug ourselves. If the group of patients is larger and the challenges for producing this on a large scale become larger, I think it is more likely that we will start licensing agreements with third parties who take over the uh, production. And for example, also uh, activities such as pharmacovigilance, with which uh, academia also has no uh, experience. So uh, Ton, uh, at the uh, introduction, already mentioned our National Pharmaceutical Knowledge Center, which was founded um, almost two years ago. Uh, the goal of this knowledge center is that we support the development of innovative drugs in academia. Um, we um, also will offer this expertise to other uh, academic centers. And uh, another focus of this uh, center is that we aim to train and teach students, pharmacists, medical doctors, masters of science in the field of drug discovery and development. And the fortunate situation is that the Paul Janssen Future Lab is very closely connected to our uh, department, the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Toxicology at LUMC. So um, uh, we can offer a lot of teaching modules. Uh, of course, there is a lot of overlap with uh, other initiatives, such as the uh, FAST program that uh, SACO will be talking about later today. There is also a very strong overlap with the uh, goals that were defined in this report from the KNAW. Uh, and also Jaap Verwey is here uh, today. And um, I think it is the time is right 
to start to align all these different initiatives and see whether together we can start a, let's say, national expertise center, as it is mentioned in this KNAW report. Uh, I think the time is there, and um, uh, with the statement, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. I think we can all uh, reach um, the situation where we can all benefit from this initiative. So um, thank you very much to uh, the uh, people who have initiated the STARS project, because this is really, really very welcome in academia. Thank you to Victoria. Um, my final slide. Um, I think academic pharma has been put on the map. Uh, we are there. Um, we are not positioning ourselves as a substitute for Big Pharma. I think we are complementary to what Big Pharma is uh, doing. We are trying to um, reduce the attrition rate of uh, compounds. We would like to uh, enable uh, uh, future researchers in crossing the valley of death and bringing their compounds into clinical phase studies. Um, the expertise that we are currently developing should be bundled, and I think with this we can support uh, academic researchers. Um, my focus so far has been on Leiden, but I realize there is also a very big national uh, need. And uh, again, if we want to achieve the critical mass that we need to help all these different centers, I think it's crucial that we combine forces and work uh, from a national perspective. So um, um, with this, I would like to end my uh, presentation and uh, give the word back to uh, the chairman. Thank you. Turn, thank you very much for your very nice overview of what's happening in Leiden and, and uh, in the Netherlands. Um, Questions, time for questions. So let's look at the chat. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, you can bring in your chat if you want to, and uh, we will ask the questions. Um, can you comment on the conflict between scientific advice, which requires an open scientific discussion, and getting funding, investors, selling a possible drug? Sure. Um, I'm not sure whether it really is a, a conflict. Um, the scientific advice part, I think, is very crucial in this drug development program. Uh, it can um, uh, give directions to what kind of studies you need to do, what kind of endpoints you need to choose, and how to develop your drug uh, further. Um, and this very open and transparent discussion should definitely take place. Um, if I go to uh, investors, um, I don't think investors are very naive, and I don't think investors uh, can be easily fooled. And in my perspective, it is better to be open to the strengths and weaknesses of your uh, uh, compound, rather than trying to uh, hide certain aspects of this. So it, um, uh, I don't think there really is a conflict effect. Okay, that's, I think, a clear opinion. Uh, should the National Expertise Center focus on academic pharma or also include industry? Yeah, well, yeah that's hmm. a very nice uh, question. Um, I think the expertise that we are currently developing, uh, if I look at big pharma, I think in general in big pharma this expertise is present already and I don't think they are really waiting for a National Expertise Center. If I look at the SMEs, the situation I think is different. And um, uh, I think that uh, also for SMEs, our national expertise center can be of uh, added value. Um, so I do see that uh, they can benefit from this as well, for sure. Okay, yeah. clear. Um, is the risk of strengthening academic drug development that more similar drugs reach later stage drug development and are not killed earlier in the valley of death? And is that good or bad? Um, if I understand the question correctly, the question is, uh, would I fear that a drug fails at a later, later stage than in the early phase? Um, I'll check again. Uh, 
No, I don't, I don't think that is a, a big risk. I think uh, several compounds are now failing in the valley of death because the models that were used in the preclinical phase or the endpoints were, that were used in the clinical phase were not representative of the uh, clinical studies or the aim that this drug is developed for. So by um, reducing the risk of uh, failure in the valley of death doesn't necessarily mean that they will fail uh, at a later phase. I don't think that's, that's the case. Okay. Um, if you still have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Teun, um, I was wondering uh, if you develop a drug and you want to register and you want yep. to be a marketing authorization holder, sure. how about liability? <laughs> um, uh, well, liability is definitely an issue. Uh, it is also something that we as, as academic re uh, researchers do not have a lot of experience with. Um, I think at some point in time, it is likely that uh, a drug which is developed within academia will end up in a spin-off company very closely connected to academia. Um, also because the, uh, let's say, the funding that you need to reach the registration phase is so high that um, it is no longer possible to, to use this as, let's say, a project within a single department, but that it is uh, safer to uh, put this in a small spin-off company outside the hospital. And of course, there uh, the liability issues will uh, be included, such as it is true also for other uh, companies. Yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of drugs, I think, uh, are typically academic drugs to be developed? Are it ATMPs, or what, what do you think of that? Well, so uh, the ATMPs are definitely a category where the involvement of academia is very big. Uh, if you now look at phase two and phase three studies, uh, ongoing in the field of ATMPs, 40% is actually uh, initiated by academia and taken yeah. care of by academia and only 60% by other parties. In the small molecule field, of course, the percentage is much, much smaller. Uh, nevertheless, I think also within the small molecules, I see a lot of possibilities. Um, the limited experience that I have now myself is in drugs developed for uh, oncology, for uh, neurology, for dermatology. So I think there are many uh, different uh, potential applications here. Okay. Um, let's look uh, another question. How can we create clear incentives at academic level for researchers to seek early on what formal scientific regulatory advice and to valorize their research? Yeah. Well, in addition to publications, etc. Yeah, yeah no, it's, a, it's a very good point, of course. I, I, in my presentation, I emphasize that the main focus of a researcher is on reaching this top publication in a very high-ranked journal. And of course, if uh, somebody like me would tell them, well, don't publish it now, you know, keep it uh, for yourself right now until things like intellectual property is covered, then uh, if you have to show your scientific output, the board of directors may think, oh, this is quite uh, disappointing. Um, I do think that uh, boards of directors currently realize that there is more in life than scientific publications only, and that uh, uh, things like having a patent or not, um, uh, valorization, being involved in spin-off companies, definitely also is taken into account for, let's say, judging whether your department is doing well or not. So um, I don't really think it will be a problem to postpone uh, uh, scientific publication. Okay, oh. clear. Uh, still, questions are coming in. How can we increase the awareness of academics on protecting their intellectual property? Yeah, well, so uh, meetings like this, of course, yes. are uh, going to help. Um, but I also feel that for somebody like myself, within my own institution, I need to uh, convey the message to the researchers that this is, this is an issue. So this is being done by, let's say, local uh, scientific meetings, uh, invitations of different uh, research groups on you know, presenting what is academic pharma and what can we do for you. Uh, and I think with these kind of uh, interactions, I think they will gradually learn uh, the importance of this. Okay, yeah. clear. 
should we not expand further from the national level to the European level? Regulation is the same. Yeah, sure. Now, <laughs> think big. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, good point. Um, at, in my point of view, I think at this point in time, I think we need to first align the national initiatives and make sure that within the Netherlands we um, develop this expertise centrum. I, I think this, the moment is exactly right. Many people are looking in the same direction. Uh, but it's true, uh, this is a, a, a global playing field. And uh, with people from the Medicines Evaluation Board and from EMA within the Netherlands, I think we also have a very good chance to, to bring this to a higher European level as well. Yeah, yeah. okay, clear. These were the questions. Okay. Um, the EMA came to the Netherlands sure. a few years ago. Yeah. And does, does that have give the push for what's happening now eh, and what you showed? Sure, it, it, I think it has given a very positive vibe to uh, the field. Um, I think there are new job opportunities for people. Uh, which stimulates students, PhDs, to work in this field. Uh, I think literally the distance to EMA has become smaller, so we, uh, it is more easy for us to knock on the door and ask for the advice. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is the, the realization that this is an important part of such a development program, and that academic researchers do not have to be shy uh, to go there. You know, they are, they are open for us. You're okay. welcome. Yeah. Turn a clear message. Sure. Thank you very much for your very clear presentation. You. And then we go to the next speaker. We now will continue with uh, Professor Carla Hollack. She's a professor in metabolic diseases, in particular inborn errors of metabolism at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. She's one of the founders of the Medici Medicine for the Maatschappij, Medicine for Society, a knowledge platform focusing on sustainable and affordable medicines for a rare disease and making those available for patients. Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ton. And um, first of all, of course, I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to give a talk here on the developments that I've been witnessing from our academic standpoint and with a particular focus on uh, orphan drugs and also with a particular focus on the road to patient access which I think is extremely important not just the development but also to reach uh, the patient. First of all of course I will show you my disclosures we work with pharmaceutical companies, especially our Center for Lysosomal Storage Disorder, Sphinx, works with pharmacy in the pre-marketing phase, so we perform studies. In the post-marketing phase, uh, there are no financial interactions with pharmaceutical companies. And also, as Ton already mentioned, we have initiated a platform which is called Medicine for Society, or Medicine for the Maatschappij, so you can see the website, the website is in Dutch, but it also gives you an overview of what we are currently doing. Now, uh, Teun van Gelder already uh, gave you a very interesting um, update on what academic pharma could, um, could be. And he mentioned also the report of the KNW, um, the Royal Academy uh, of Science. And I think it is very interesting to look at this first uh, graphic that is part of this uh, study where it shows you in fact that um, there is a sort of misalignment at this uh, stage. So um, patients, academia, industry and regulators are involved in drug development but there is a lack of alignment of these parties along the road of an idea to um, in in the end, the patient. So ideally, this should be um, in the future, be better aligned so that also academia is more involved, but also patients are more involved from the beginning of a drug development. So that is absolutely not something that is new. Uh, we are talking about this already for years, maybe even decades. But the reality is that it is not always happening. 
And so it's interesting to see why is that not happening. And our interest uh, goes especially to the area of uh, rare diseases of orphan drugs. It was also already mentioned by Tone that this is especially something that can be developed from academia and is something where we can make a difference. And orphan drugs are very interesting, um, especially because if we look at the landscape of drug development in the future, what you see happening, in fact, is that more and more diseases are being rare diseases, and more and more drugs that are being developed are for small indications. So this is a big area, and it's going to grow. And when you look in the literature, and we heard this before in the talks, several of these orphan indications, they start in academia. But there are issues with orphan drugs. And some of these concerns are with the rising prices, that may be a health uh, care affordability threat. And in line with that, what we see is that many of these drugs enter the market at a very high price because they have uh, a price based upon the value for the patient. That, of course, does make a lot of sense. You don't want to bring uh, medicines to the market that do not have an added value for your patient. But on the other, other hand, it can also um, um, result in extreme prices. If you think about a gene therapy that makes a difference between life and death for a young child, and if you put 80,000 euros per quality to that patient, you will get enormous amounts of money. On the other hand, it could be that an innovation for a rare, very rare disorder leads to a negative business case if you cannot get a return on investment. So a value-based price is not always, in our opinion, the way to go. What we also see is what a threat is to the rising prices is that there is limited competition in the orphan world. And even after the uh, orphan drug um, uh, protection is, is um, expired, then we see not many, uh, for example, biosimilars or for the very, very indications, new drugs appearing. Another thing is the effectiveness. Many orphan drugs enter the market based upon very early clinical outcomes, sometimes surrogates. So there is a lot of uncertainty about the effectiveness, especially in the real-world situation. And post-marketing evidence generation can be extremely complicated, also because not all of these parties that I mentioned before could be involved. And in very extreme instances, we see that orphan drug leg legislation can be also misused to bring old drugs to the market for a very high price. I, th I think and I hope that that will uh, be the exception. But all of these developments and all of these issues can lead to more procedures, more regulations, and in the end, to delayed access to the patient. So improving access for patients with orphan diseases is the, the goal of our platform that we launched two and a half years ago, where we have a knowledge platform, we are performing projects, we're doing research with that aim improving access to medicines for patients with rare diseases. And what I will do is give you a couple of examples where we are working on. Because we work case-based. And the reason for that is exactly what has been the subject already in the previous talks, that we don't understand each other language, but it even goes deeper. It's not just the language, it is the deeper understanding of what regulators do and what academia is doing. And so if you work case-based, you can sort of visualize what we are doing and what the problems are that we are encountering. We can learn from that with other parties and then hopefully help our colleagues to uh, also uh, find these roads to, to access for orphan drugs. So, Routes to access is something that we uh, uh, support our colleagues with. To, you could think of compounding uh, um, a product. You could also go to even a central authorization. We heard about that. Repurposing trajectories are very interesting. And this is especially also something that comes from academia. And perhaps help to also improve regulatory pathways by showing uh, what kind of system issues there are uh, when we are looking at these development pathways. 
An important thing is, of course, education and advice. That is something that we should do with other universities, of course, with the STARS project that is extremely important from the uh, uh, CBG. So just to give you a couple of examples how we have been working from case to system, I show you this example of mexlatine. First of all, a signaling of a shortage of this medicine, a short-term uh, solution with compounding by several pharmacies in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, related to that, development of a pricing model by one of our PhD students. Then discussions on the pricing and in the end a publication on pricing on a whole and pricing models. So to give you a little bit of insight in this case, Mexlatine has been a very old drug. It has been developed in the 70s originally as an antiarrhythmic. And further development for this uh, drug already happened in the 80s uh, for non dystrophic myotonia. So there was already a rational pharmacotherapy that was in 2014 acknowledged also in the Netherlands. But then it was a sort of hijacked as an orphan drug and the price rose from around 200 euros per patient per year to 25,000. And that led especially for that indication for non-dystrophic myotonia to a shortage for the patients with arrhythmia. And for that reason, our cardiologists, and you can see the publication on the right, Peter Postema, uh, published um, a, uh, a very nice paper with colleagues from Europe showing that there was absolutely an issue here, an issue not just with the shortage, but also an issue on the systems level with the orphan drug legislation that would allow such a thing to happen. So um, what also um, happened after that with our platform and uh, Sibren van der Berg uh, took the opportunity to look at the price of this product versus what, in our view, would be an acceptable or a fair price. And for that, he looked at the AIM drug pricing model that has been developed for fair and transparent prices for accessible pharmaceutical innovations. And he um, looked at the different elements in that model and came uh, up with a price for um, this product per patient per year somewhere between 450 and 2,000 euros per patient. So even if you would re see this, this product as an innovative medicine, which it wasn't, then the price would be much lower than the price that the company has asked for this. So why is this of interest? This is just a case. But you can bring that to the systems level to, in the end, also show it in a publication and hopefully alert, for example, governments, but also other people in the field, that we should look at pricing as a separate issue to improve access of medicines. So in this case, our um, uh, minister at that time uh, for uh, health affairs, uh, Van Ark, said that we shouldn't have this kind of developments. So it gained a lot of attention. And uh, furthermore, we joined forces with the Zorg Institute, the Healthcare Institute, and uh, Marcel Canois, who is a health economist, to write um, a, a review for the Dutch um, Journal of Medicine about different models of pricing. And to perhaps think through how in the future, for some products, we might not always, uh, we should not always rely on value-based pricing, for example. So, um, another case that I would like to uh, show to you is about drug repurposing. So and, um, here we, as uh, um, Teun uh, van Gelder also uh, mentioned, we look at an unmet need. So there's no issue in academic format to start with a drug that's already there to make a Me Too product or a generic. There should be an unmet need. Then there's the possibility also, again, for, of course, very small scale for compounding. Also for compounding, you can perform studies with a compounded product, but you can also start with a new sort of public-private partnership to do studies and to bring a product to the market. 
So roads to sustainable access are very important here. And then, of course, the entire uh, development by academia, even to a level that it's registered. Now, such a thing is happening at this point uh, with, uh, under the supervi supervision of uh, Professor Mario van der Knaap. And um, she is a child neurologist at our center and heads the Amsterdam Leukodystrophy Center. She is absolutely an expert on white matter. And one of a very rare diseases is vanishing white matter. A terrible disaster uh, happens, as you can see on these graphs, in the brain of small children, where um, the, the white matter disappears. And these patients, the classical form of these patients, experience a decline in motor skills between two and six years of age, sometimes with an accelerated decline provoked by stress, and they die. You can see on the right-hand side the course of disease. She studied not only the pathophysiology of the disorder, but also the natu natural disease course. And not only that, she also um, discovered the uh, pathophysiology behind vanishing white matter. And by showing how it works, she identified, for example, that there is a very important role for what we call the integrated stress response. So the integrated stress response is a sort of key modulator of development of disease in this um, disorder. And she found that an old compound, guanabens, is able to modulate that ISR. So, um, now she has taken action to develop that compound. She patented it for this indication. She found um, um, a supplier for the raw material and it's been now dispensed in a clinical trial. So she has already shown that it works in mice as an inhibitor of this uh, stress response and that it can improve brain pathology. And as we speak, she launched a clinical study uh, a monocenter clinical trial, but patients from all over the world come to her center to be treated for this disorder. We helped her as a platform with an implementation plan for extension of the trial, but also regulatory advice. Should she go through the national or central route? Um, should we go for an orphan designation? And in the end, what she wants, what her idea is as an academic, is to make this available worldwide for a cost-based price. So in, the only goal here is to help patients, not to gain a profit. So based on this, our researcher, Sibren van den Berg again, um, made uh, an inventory of the several drug repurposing uh, trajectories and also looked back and uh, orphan drugs that entered the market, and how many of those were in fact discovered by academia. I will not elaborate on that here, because um, I know that uh, Bert Leufkens is going to mention this later in his talk as well. The last thing I wanted to mention in my talk is that it's not just about development from academia, it's also road to access, also road to access for orphan drugs that are developed by pharmaceutical companies. And for that, we need um, also very, very good registries. We need to be active as healthcare professionals with per, uh, patient organizations to set up that kind of registries to allow evidence generation to become uh, better and better and to have uh, also pathways developed for early access. So this is something that we do together with Daphne Schoenmakers, a PhD student in our institution, supervised by Professor Dr. Nicole Wolf, who is also a, a child neurologist. And um, the subject of the registry that they have been setting up is on metachromatic leukodystrophy, where there is now a new gene therapy coming to the market. So the objective of this initiative is to create one independent disease registry so we can collaborate with the expertise centers, but also collect data on the long-term outcomes of these novel therapies, not just gene therapy, also enzyme therapy is coming there. That means that that registry needs to be aligned with regulatory requirements. And I think this is something that we also need to educate our academics, that that is very, very important when you start a registry. 
So she's, they set up a very nice collaborative network that is supported also by the European reference networks. And um, recently, even this week, uh, a consensus paper came out uh, on the definition of disease parameters in this registry. And that is also aligned then with UC Peter Moll here also as one of the co-authors and Wim Roets because this initiative is also part of the uh, work that's been done by the Healthcare Institute on uh, registries at the moment. So um, we are very happy that we set up from the beginning that kind of collaboration for this purpose. Last but not least, we are working with several groups, with uh, insurance companies and also supported by the Healthcare Institute and with patient organizations to see whether we can develop a route to access for orphan drugs, which is called the Drug Access Protocol for Orphans. It has some similarities with the Drug Access Protocol that already exists for oncology products. So we hope that way that new uh, products that come to the market already immediately start in a framework where the initial uh, phase of um, treatment of patients on an individual level is uh, provided for free by the company and then if it works for a patient then on an indiv individual level there can be a previously negotiated price being paid by the insurance companies and after some time that's all laid down in a protocol we can make a systems decision on whether this uh, product uh, should be fully reimbursed or for a subgroup of patients, etc. So it is evidence generation on the job to allow patients to have a very quick and early access to the drugs. So again, I would like to uh, end up with the report from the KNAW where it shows that integration of all these parties and to, in the end, hopefully come to a coordinating center, we heard it before, for uh, medicine development. And that's where I would like to end. Thank you, Carla, for your very nice presentation. And interesting that you're a doctor treating patients, but also doing research and involved in regulatory pathways, etc. Took me some years. Yeah, I understand that. Um, we have questions, so let's start with that. Uh, would you consider value-based pricing ever appropriate? Won't it generally lead to steep pricing strategies by commercial pharmaceutical companies? Uh, the answer is, um, I think it is appropriate in some instances. Um, and for uh, products where, where you really don't know what the effectiveness yet is, or the full picture, you cannot even think of value-based pricing because you don't know what exactly will be the value. So that might be uh, very, very, very difficult. On the other hand, value-based pricing has been launched, especially because we don't want to pay, pay high prices for something that doesn't have a lot of value for our patient. So um, I think we should explore several ways of pricing. So perhaps in the beginning, you should have a price negotiation based upon, for example, um, the amount of money that has been used for R&D and development, etc. And in the end, if you're more knowledgeable about the value, you can go into discussion with a company and say, OK, this is such an important uh, product for you. It is acceptable if the price is set at a higher level. In the end, there are also other models like pay models or there is uh, what in the United States is called the P-Quad model. That means that after many, many years when the, uh, the patent is expired, um, then of, uh, you could go back to a sort of cost-based pricing because then the idea is that there would be sufficient return of investment to produce new products. This is something that is should absolutely be also discussed with pharmaceutical companies because we can as academics think of these nice new models they will have to comply with that clear okay so that that's still open eh? but there are a lot of possibilities and and i what i understand is you're open for that to find out what what is the best and probably it will 
uh, depending on the drug or the disease, what, what's the exactly, best? Exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, what are your thoughts on collecting data from long-term registries in rare disease? What would be the main value for drug development, drug safety or understanding disease and effectiveness of a drug? Yeah, not drug safety. I think pharmacovigilance is something that we um, are not equipped to do. So you need a uh, good collaboration here. I think for a drug that enters the market, the uh, marketing authorization holder should be responsible for the pharmacovigilance. Sometimes, of course, there are safety alerts that are also important for the long-term outcome, for effectiveness. So you need to have an alignment of databases sometimes here. And um, for the long-term effectiveness, I think it would be very, very important to have registries of a high level. So we have had a lot of criticisms of existing registries that are incomplete, that cannot, um, that, that, um, that is voluntary. So I even would advocate that you should have a sort of kind of mandatory system for physicians when they uh, want to treat a patient with a new product where there are a lot of open questions. You have to put data high quality data that have been aligned with patient organizations, with physicians, with regulators in this very um, uh, good uh, registry to be able to in the end say for this patient this medicine works, for that patient perhaps we should not uh, continue treatment or not even start treatment. I think you can speed up absolutely the process of more um, uh, getting a better view on what is the appropriate use of a medicine that way. Yeah, yeah, and, and what we see more and more single arm trials, and that you want to have an historic control group, which is also well defined. I, I was wondering, you said, well, not for safety, but what is the problem of when you have a registry and you, you look at all effects which are happening or all medical events? Yeah, what, I, what do you I'm mean by no safety? Well, I think safety, of course, is very important, but I think what you need for a very, uh, I mean, safety is, is crucial to be uh, in, a, in a detailed way to be captured uh, very soon, um, uh, very early on. Um, I don't see that we as academic researchers can take on that job. I think pharmaceutical companies have usually very, very good ph uh, pharmacovigilance departments. And um, so you have to report everything twen uh, within 24 hours, uh, uh, serious adverse events, etc., etc. You need to report about that back to the EMA. I think this, this is in particular an area where pharmaceutical companies are extremely strong. Yeah. Why should we take that over? Uh, okay, so then it's about uh, but collecting side effects because yeah, you are seeing uh, the patients. No, but I agree and, with you and it on be that. In the registry yeah. then. No, 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 of course. It's the process after. Yeah. Okay. So it is, um, uh, I think they are, they are much stronger than we are in, yeah. in doing that job. But there needs to be an alignment between uh, databases, registries. So, of course, if safety concerns, issues, especially when they are concerned with the uh, outcome of patients, they should be captured in that registry as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, we go to the next question. Would you like to see more governmental legislation to prevent hijacking? And if so, what should that legislation look like? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, um, as far as I'm concerned that hijacking, I think and I hope that that is still uh, very exceptional. So um, and I've also talked to, to pharmaceutical companies. They're not happy with that kind of development. So... Um, the, within the orphan drug legislation, there is a possibility for this hijacking. So if you want to change something, it should be there at that level. So, for example, you could um, uh, make um, uh, also the, the EMA more aware. And I think there is also a, um, a regulation that says that if there is a good compounded formula, for example, uh, that would uh, preclude um, to get an orphan uh, drug um, uh, on the market as, or being marketed as an orphan drug. So things like that. And also if at, at some point um, 
uh, you could see that uh, that if prices are outrageous, that for example the the time of market uh, exclusivity is is shortened or uh, changed. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. We go to the next one. Would it be more efficient to transfer regulatory knowledge to such academia centers so they can provide regulatory support to the individual researchers? train the trainer concept, or would it be still better to keep this to the regulatory agencies? I think keep it to the regulatory agencies. I think we need you. And, uh, but uh, what we need is to um, show our academic researchers that we can do a lot more together and that they don't have to uh, put everything away or that there is a certain um, area where they couldn't enter. They can but they need help and they need to know how. And uh, I think it's exactly what Teun also expressed. But I see that, that m many of my colleagues have no time. They don't have any knowledge. They say, um, well, this is too difficult yes. for me. Um, uh, it is difficult, uh, let's be honest. So um, we need to um, make them aware of the possibilities. Okay. We have to end here. Thank you very much, Carla, for coming here and uh, answering the questions and have a nice conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think from here, I will... Um, yeah, yeah. I, we go to the breakout session, we call that. Uh, it's meet the PhD students. And uh, there are now 30 minutes, uh, and then you have to the opportunity to watch uh, videos of five selected PhD projects. You already could have seen them. Uh, it are projects where the MEB is involved. Uh, at this moment we have about 15 PhD projects going on. Um, uh, recently we had the MEB science policy from 2020 to 24, and we had eight different teams identified. And uh, for instance, uh, the three R's project uh, about animal experiments. Uh, to also a theme is risk communication. Um, these selected PhD projects, those five, uh, reflect something of the themes we have chosen. Uh, so I invite you to go to the Meet the PhD Students page on the website, ask your questions in the chat, and the PhD student will directly communicate with you. Um, and uh, also remember that at the end of this program, at quarter to five, uh, you will also be able to meet them face to face in the networking room. So now take your time to go to the PhD students, have nice interactions, and we will then at uh, 20 past three, uh, we will go on with our program. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you have had uh, fruitful discussions with uh, the PhD students. I understood there's a lot of chatting going on. And as I already told you, you can really speak them live at the end of this program. Uh, now we come to the second part of the program. Uh, first, we have one interview, followed by three short talks about initiatives and recommendations which aim to improve, amongst other knowledge for academics about regulatory requirements. And at the end of the talk, we have a panel discussion. So you can ask questions during the talks, but there will be no um, answering directly behind the talks. Um, uh, at our table, you can see um, uh, Professor Jaap Verwey, Emeritus, Bert Leukens, we all know, of course, and Sacco Visser. Um, and uh, they will be involved in a panel discussion. But we start now with an interview with um, uh, Clemens Ross van Dorp. She is the ambassador of the life science and health sector, and she has held management positions at various organizations and was state secretary at the Minister of Health, Welfare and Sport during the last five years. So let's first look at the interview. Hi, uh, I'm Clemence Ross and I'm the ambassador uh, for the action program uh, New Chances for the Life Science and Health Top Sector. Uh, this is an action program that uh, uh, is a result of the working together from all the stakeholders in the field of life sciences and health uh, to be able to, to make uh, uh, 
life science and health stronger in the Netherlands to make ourselves seen better in the world and of course to be in a Champions League of life sciences and health because that's what we want. A couple of years ago we became very much aware of the fact that we have beautiful clusters uh, in Amsterdam, Leiden, in, in 12 and more places in the Netherlands, which of course the Netherlands is very small, you know, in, in, in the world. It's, it's like a, a post stamp. It's like one city of 17 million people. But we have a lot of clusters that really have good profiles. But we did not seem to have a Dutch profile of life sciences and health. So we came very much aware of the fact that we needed that to, uh, to show in the world what the Netherlands is really about and how we work, not only what we do, but we do it in a specific way. Um, and we have uh, tried to pronounce our national proposition with the whole field of stakeholders in an ecosystem dialogue from academia to pharma, everybody was engaged, hospitals, um, and the ministries, of course, economic affairs and climate and health, Ministry of Health, uh, Welfare and Sports. So we all work together uh, and we also defined actions that could make our life sciences and health system stronger. So now we're at the tipping point of some of these actions to, to carry them out and to say, well, we're going to do that and we need each other. So it was a very, very nice process. And of course, for academia, these actions are very important because it means that we're going to try to find out how we can bring research to the patient or to the market. And of course, that's why we are doing it. We all are doing this work for the patient. Well, for example, it's very important to see how, can, how we can best connect with the UP European Medicines Agency. Uh, and uh, we, of course, in the Netherlands have our own system, which works very well. Uh, we, we can trust our medicines and therapies, but we are part of Europe. So it's so important that we have a very good connection with EMA. So as an ambassador myself, I had some encounters with Emma Cook and there's a couple of people who I work with very closely from academia and from institutions like uh, the CBG uh, to see how we can make this connection work better. For example, in the field of rare diseases, ATMPs, real world data and how we can connect our uh, perhaps incubator status in the Netherlands of beautiful things that we do to the needs of Europe and the demands of all the patients in Europe and outside Europe. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, and I'm sure everybody will hear from that within the next coming years. Fundamental research is the, is the basics of everything. Without fundamental research, without curiosity, without trying to find out something or just trying and not even knowing what's coming of it. That's what it really is about. The most important inventions I can think of sometimes just suddenly popped up. It was not a finance that said, well, we want you to invent this or that and work at that and then it comes. No, it does not work that way. So I think it's when you want to be in a Champions League, you really have to uh, provide for enough money for fundamental research. But then when you're starting doing that, it might be that you find out something that you think, wow, this is great. This is gonna, this is really something for the patient or whatever, we're gonna do this. But it, it happens quite often that the researcher thinks then, well, then now what? Uh, because uh, I have to develop this, this it, I need money, wh where to go to? And I think it's so important that, in, that we also integrate in, in academia knowledge of how you can bring your, your research into the next steps and how, how you work together with this field of stakeholders. And everybody wants this, so I think this is going to happen. So 
I would advise be engaged, mm -hmm. say that you need it, that you want it. We can also do this online. Hmm? COVID has learned us that it's not necessary always to, to go places all the time. So I think this is important. And also that we try to, to think of the type of business that new uh, invention therapies, uh, medicine needs, because it's not always big pharma that is going to produce what you find out and for, for this patient, right? what you discover. You know? So um, we must think about this, and I think that it is, this is the work of the whole ecosystem, big pharma included, and that we must keep uh, um, the beautiful things also in the Netherlands, so, not, uh, so that we can have startups, scale-ups in business where you also as academia uh, stay involved with and not just, well, discover something just for the sale. For the subsequent uh, three talks, uh, you can put questions into the chat. That's important for the panel discussion we, we will have in the end. Um, uh, we first start now with Sako de Visser. Um, he will talk about public investments for future affordable and sustainable therapies. FAST. He's the uh, intended director, so that's an important position, of course. Um, and he is already part of this initiative from the start. Uh, he's involved in different organizations, such as ATRIS, Future Lab Leiden. And uh, he's always trying to connect people with the aim to drive research and drug development forward, with a special interest in rare disease and drug repurposing. Sako, 10 minutes for you. Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, the opportunity to talk here. Um, I would like to talk about the uh, platform FAST. Uh, and start off with stating that tomorrow's uh, therapies might not necessarily automatically fit in yesterday's paradigms or yesterday's regulations apply. So, uh, for instance, uh, novel therapies could more be a composite, actually, of a drug, a device, a diagnostic and data, a much more a 4D uh, model, if you will. Also, the challenges uh, around uh, affordability are much more prevalent uh, for future therapies. Affordability that could hamper for patients, that could hamper access, but also affordability to companies to actually embark on further developing the uh, drug and delivering it to patients. So, to meet these challenges, uh, public funding is obviously uh, needed, and uh, in the future, in the, in the past, public funding has been somewhat scattered and based upon two pillars, uh, one generally uh, focusing on, on generalized economic growth and the other one focused on public health uh, issues and affordability arises. So to combine these two agendas, so economic growth and uh, delivering uh, uh, therapies to patients in an, assess in an affordable way is the, uh, is the aim of the platform FAST, Future Affordable and Sustainable Therapies. Now, the key issue that we would uh, tackle is to coordinate these public funding in, in for therapy development in the future. Combining innovation and affordability and always focusing on the unmet medical needs for patients, because that is in the end what everybody, every initiative presented here as well, is focusing on. So together, trying to face the challenges of modern affordable therapy development. Utilizing and optimizing, so also investing in infrastructure that's needed for whoever is embarking on this journey to deliver new therapies to patients, because that is our key, uh, key strategy. We try to stimulate entrepreneurial uh, biomedics, uh, whoever uh, from, from either industry or public-private uh, partnerships or academia who want to pioneer in this area and who want to face these challenges and come up with innovative solutions where innovation and affordability can go hand in hand. So our strategy is not, we are not exclusively to fund academic drug development. We're not, by definition, not to, uh, by definition, fund public-private partnerships, nor uh, 
uh, stimulate company and uh, private uh, embark uh, efforts to deliver drugs to patients. We are there to deliver uh, drugs to patients, regardless who is doing it. We try to stimulate the new, uh, the new generation of drug developers that face these issues. Now, the four pillars that we're active on is, uh, we, as I stated, we strengthen the national infrastructure and education that's needed for whoever wants to embark on this mission. We signal and address bottlenecks and opportunities in the development chain. We, most of all, uh, uh, first and foremost, coordinate the funding of, uh, public, uh, of, public, um, uh, of public money. Um, and we bring together the knowledge and expertise that is uh, so badly needed and a sort of prerequisite for anybody who's, uh, who's willing to, um, to embark on a mission of developing novel therapies. So you've heard quite a few uh, initiatives today as well, and I think we have been involved in, in every one of them, to be honest. Uh, we are currently implementing uh, the recommendations that uh, Jaap Verweij will talk about later, uh, from the report that was mentioned earlier, and established FAST as the coordinating center of expertise. With all the, uh, with all the good um, initiatives that we've already seen, uh, Toyn van Gelder, who, who, did, who, um, who presented his, uh, his um, uh, foundation in Leiden, um, Carlo Hollack focusing on rare diseases in Amsterdam. Um, the umbrella organization that we need nationally is what we're trying to establish in FAST. We have already uh, funded a couple of uh, infrastructural uh, projects, including um, uh, in the area of education, the Paul Janssen Future Lab, as we mentioned before, educating uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial bio biomedics who uh, have a broader interest in their own specific uh, original expertise. Uh, we have funded a regulatory science project where Brad Leufkens, I think, maybe reflect on later. And we are investigating with partner organizations such as uh, Health Holland or Investinel or the R uh, RVO in how we can align, better align public funding to reach the goals that we want as a society. So what sort of prerequisites do we need to, to uh, impose in an early stage? How do we translate it? How we make future um, um, private align, it, align uh, new projects to um, funding to, for private partners? Um, so the, we're re researching the how. Um, the other pillar that we are, uh, uh, are in, engaged in is that some uh, money is available, not surprisingly, to the uh, infectious disease area. We're investing in, in COVID-19 uh, novel therapy development uh, infrastructure to do so. We have uh, successfully uh, granted a... Um, an IMI project uh, where we are heading a European funders network for repurposing uh, new medicine um, of medicines, uh, old medicines for new uh, diseases. Um, it's called Remedy for All, if you're interested, and it's uh, probably on the uh, IATRA's uh, website. And we have been involved in the development and uh, subsequent uh, discussions, uh, proposals for the National Growth Fund. And one was mentioned earlier, the uh, PharmaNL initiative is where we are one of the uh, partners uh, and hopefully will generate lots of new investment money that we could actually uh, use uh, and uh, to stimulate and reach our goals. So that is sort of our, the overview of what I've, try, uh, I've tried to state here. FAST is here to coordinate the public funding. We're trying to combine innovation and affordability and, and really pioneer uh, in, in affordable uh, treatment and, and deliver them to patients because in the that's the challenges that we face as a society. And the Netherlands is, is beautifully equipped to, to embark on this mission. And what we need is a proper uh, alignment of public uh, money and public interest as well. And that's what we're trying to deliver as FAST. So thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sako. Um, at least your um, slides were very innovative. <laughs> That's something. Uh, thank you very much. No discussion at this moment, um, and you're uh, strictly worth within the time of 10 minutes. But we go to the next speaker now. That's uh, Professor Jaap Verwey, Emeritus Professor. Uh, he will talk about efficiency gains 
through innovation in medicines development and how can science contribute to that and how can stakeholders be aligned. It's the KNAWA perspective. We already heard something about reports and you were chairing that uh, committee. Uh, very important. Um, you were professor of medical oncology at the Erasmus University and also have been dean there. Um, he is now the managing director of the Cancer Drug Development Forum in Brussels, um, uh, the chair of the KNAW I already mentioned, uh, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Tom, and uh, my pleasure to uh, report on behalf of my colleagues from the committee that was involved in producing this report from the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, you've already seen Carla Hollack and you will see Bert Lovkens in a minute. Uh, and I was also joined by Professor Carl Moens from Utrecht as an epidemiologist, uh, Professor Karen Uyl from Rotterdam, who is a health technology assessment expert, uh, Professor Christine Mummery, an expert in models of diseases, uh, Henk-Jan Gugelaar, an actual colleague of Ten van Gelder from Leiden University. And, uh, um, we were supported in a fantastic way by our secretary, Eva Nanik, who I should give most of the credit of what we did. Now, if we look at the process that we have been discussing today already uh, multiple times of drug development, this is the basic that uh, is, is, is uh, talked about there. And you've seen this in a different way presented by Teun van Gelder already. It starts with basic research, drug discovery, and it ends with patient access. The problem here is that we are facing a very slippery and difficult road, and it can take a long time before a drug that is invented actually reaches the market and the patient. It used to be, when I started my career decades ago, it used to be 10 to 15 years. That's been shortened, meanwhile, to only, quote, unquote, 5 to 10 years, but it's still 5 to 10 years, which is a very long period of time. The problem is also that it takes a lot of money. Uh, Turn mentioned an amount of $800 million dollars to develop a drug. I have heard figures of 2 billion European euros to develop a drug. So it, it at least is an amount of money that I guess academia will never be able to uh, allow itself and, and afford itself. So let's look where we did we go wrong. Um, that's what the committee did. Where can we really make a, an improvement there? Where can science truly contribute to, to a, a, a better life? Well, where we mostly did go wrong were at three places. The first one is a lack of truly predictive disease models. The problem is that we have to, before we got into the clinic for the clinical develop, do a lot of research, not only in the target discovery, in the drug discovery phase, but also in this area where you move from, uh, a predict from a disease model into man, into the clinic. And the problem there is that we have no good models to predict what's going to happen in a human being. Um, this is one of the reasons why we need so many drugs before, uh, in this discovery pipeline before we get to one drug ultimately at the end that patients get access to. Again, when I started my career it was in, in oncology, it was 100,000 compounds that led to only one drug. Now we have improved tremendously. Now it's only, quote unquote again, 10,000 compounds that lead to one drug. So we've made a tenfold uh, improvement and still we are a long way from where we should be. Uh, in the optimal uh, day and age, of course, it should be a one-on-one. -on -one. one compound leads to one drug. Now, those models may be available. This is truly where the Netherlands takes a lead in the world. We have invented, uh, or we people have invented organoids and developed them, organs on a chip, and there are many other developments that are very promising, but yet we have to truly detect their true promise and their true predictive value for the ultimate outcome in human beings. The second place where we went wrong was in clinical trials. Uh, we tend to try to prove very subtle differences between patient groups. Uh, if you want to show that there is a half a percent improvement in survival in one patient group over the other, you need thousands of patients. So doing that in a more realistic way and show much more realistic and relevant uh, improvements, we might get away with smaller sizes of trials, but also we need to really improve and, and innovate our clinical trial models. We should never forget that the first randomized trial ever described in history was done in 1747 by a marine doctor from the British uh, Army, 
who uh, was investing uh, scurvy, and he did a randomized trial, seven armed randomized trials in 14 patients. Uh, and he, he was uh, looking at scurvy, and in the end, 12 of his patients unfortunately died, and two survived, and those two got oranges, which was the start of the uh, exploration of oranges and their contents in the treatment of the disease scurvy. Now, those trials will never exist anymore because they were not appropriate for our current methods, but at least it's something to think back of. Um, the third place where we could really make a difference is patient access that we do not talk about frequently, and this is after marketing authorization. You can't read this figure, and it's not necessary for you to read the figure, but we are talking about a European Union which is not acting as a union because it takes between one day in Germany or one day in Great Britain, which is not part of EU anymore, after marketing authorization before patients are allowed to use that drug and can get it, up to four years in countries like Greece and, and uh, Estonia, which is also part of your, uh, the uh, EU. And that's because of the second assessment that needs to be done, and which is quite complex, which is the health technology assessment. So that's another process where we can truly improve. Now, what we have seen as a committee was this fragmented landscape that Carla has already shown you. Patients hardly get involved, at certainly not early on, in the uh, drug development pathway, which means that it's not very patient-centered. Academia is involved, certainly in target discovery, sometimes in drug discovery, but then loses its involvement in the clinical phases. Industry is obviously involved because it is ultimately the party that needs to bring the drug to the market and has the... Uh, the assets available to do so, the finances available to do so, and we are obviously depending on the tremendously important work of the regulatory agencies, uh, be it the, the uh, CBG or MEB in the Netherlands or EMA, but also the health technology assessors that need to decide whether a drug is uh, approved for marketing and then approved for patient access. Now, you can see there is no good alignment here, and what we would like to see is that something like this happens, where all of those four important stakeholders, so patient advocacy, academicians, uh, the regulatory authorities, and pharmaceutical industry, all get involved in this from the early beginnings on and stay involved up until the end, up until patient access and patient can really make use of this. This uh, may be a dream, but I think some of the talks that you've heard today already indicate that we're moving to the good direction. How could this be achieved in the Netherlands? Well, this slide you've seen also, and this is what we ultimately proposed. It would be worthwhile to have one expertise center for what we call medicines development. You can talk about drug development, but there are also therapies that are no true drugs in the old-fashioned sense of the word. So let's talk about medicines or therapies development. Um, supporting the academic institutions in their activities in this whole pathway of drug development. And not only the academics, why not also support pharmaceutical industry, patient advocacy, as well as the regulators? Uh, this should be, in our opinion, a national center, whatever we call it. This would lead to a continuous innovation, but it needs a couple of things. And some of those things have been mentioned by previous speakers already. We really need awareness and education of the topic drug development. There is post-master uh, courses. You've heard Turn talk about that. There are other initiatives already as well. There are the good initiatives from the CBG. But we feel that there is a need for a true master course, master training in drug development, which should also lead to a more easy exchange in jobs from going from regulatory agencies to industry or to academia or any other route. So there is going to be interaction there between those parties involved. It should also lead to a patient uh, efficacy support that will increase in quality, although they are already doing a fantastic job. The third issue is that there is an absolute need here to protect your patents, to protect your IP. Uh, so technology transfer is important. We should realize that the fourth pillar of the academia that was recognized by the Dutch authorities in the early century of the, uh, in this, uh, the early years of this century is valorization. So there is nothing wrong in trying to make something that has an economic benefit. In this case, it would be, uh, of course, preferred that the benefits, if there are any, 
flow back into research and not to an individual. So technology transfer should go hand in hand with business development because one of the problems that the people that are in the early phases of drug development, the fundamental researchers, they have no clue about those issues and they need to be supported from the early days on. The fourth pillar is important and it relates to the education is also recognition and rewards. Unfortunately, there is not too much of a recognition in the university system at this point in time for people that are passionately involved at the academic side of drug development. There is no appropriate reward system there, unlike for the fundamental research, of course, where there is a fantastic awarding system and rewarding system available. So this should be improved as well. And last but not least, you've already heard about registries. We always talk about real world data. We need to share data between industry, between academia, between society, and we need to jointly develop a system where the data that we are looking at and where you as CBG are looking at are really valid uh, and that they can be taken for granted and that they are they're true. So data quality and data sharing is another important element that this uh, coordinating expertise center should work on. Uh, it should really be uh, close to the granting systems as well. So that's why one of the options that we are exploring is that FAST could take this on as well as another arm of its activities and become this expertise center. Um, I'd like to stop here. Thank you for your attention. I think we really need this. Um, I'm sure we can achieve this in a small country like the Netherlands. Clemens Ross has already mentioned it. It's only a big city of 17 million people. So why don't we do it? Let's do it. And to quote uh, uh, an American president, former American president, I'm sure that we can say, yes, we can do it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Jaap Verwey. Very enthusiastic and uh, I think an important perspective from the KNAW. Um, now we go to the next uh, speaker, a speaker we know very well, Bert Leufkens, uh, Emeritus Professor of Regulatory, Drug Regulatory Sciences and Pharmaceutical Policy at the Utrecht University. Uh, he retired, but is still going on with several things. Um, he was, of course, the former chairman of the Medicines Evaluation Board, uh, and he was a member of the CHMP at the EMA for a few years. Um, still, he is also the chair of the Regulatory Science Network of the Netherlands, already from the start. Uh, very important and all the research you've done in this area. Uh, Bert, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, the MIB for this uh, very inspiring and informative um, Science Day. In particular, I enjoyed also the, the PhD students. That was not only a Science Day, but it was a science parade. Beautiful to see how these interactions uh, have also delivered wonderful science and good data to, f to, to also to stimulate our thinking. So the scope of uh, what I would like to add as a reflection also as a setup for the, for the uh, panel discussion is, um, of course, uh, a little bit of repetition of what you have heard, increased interest in academic drug development, many speakers have addressed that, is also part of the European Commission pharmaceutical strategy. We should not forget this is not something that somewhere started in, in the basements of, of academia. It is very much also European policy. And part of that, and that is the focus I would like to highlight, is regulatory systems are important in that whole strategy. And regulatory systems are never perfect. They evolve over time, and they are exposed to push and pull dynamics. That means that there are new uh, innovations coming in, how to evaluate them, how to assess them, how do you measure efficacy. But there are also, also societal mechanisms. For instance, the offer drug legislation already mentioned by Carla Horlach, that was very stimulating at the beginning, the early 2000s, and now we're discussing, okay, there are also some adverse effects from that legislation. But essentially, it was designed to stimulate orphan drug development. So these push and pull dynamics are always there. And regulatory science is there to improve the regulatory standards, to improve the procedures, to improve the decision making, but also, and that's where uh, the regulatory science network uh, is very much involved in, to understand how things work and how they can be improved. And to discuss it a little bit more in detail, I would go into two cases, and they already mentioned before today, 
One is on drug repurposing of rare diseases, studied by, by uh, one of the colleagues from, from Carla Horak. And I would like to discuss a little bit on uh, uh, think tanking of the regulatory science network, the extension of indications of licensed products. But again, the regulatory science network Netherlands is there also to add. So let's go back a little bit into the history because the MIB always played a very important role in the, in the history of regulatory science. And this is a, is a high level summary uh, starting about 15 years ago with the TI Pharma Escher project. And what you see here is you know, the, the, the heroes of the past, so Elton Breckenbridge, uh, Gunnar Al from the, from the MPA. Uh, so pe people were very stimulating also for the Dutch environment to look at. And then in the mid-2012, uh, 2017, it was particularly Christine Gispen and team that really you know, built MIB as a catalyst for the back jump. And we see here one of the PhD students, Remy uh, Francesca, also uh, presenting work on risk minimization. But now we are in the phase of multi-stakeholder engagement. And that has already mentioned a couple of times, this the picture here is of a recent uh, um, expert meeting or um, uh, workshop when People from the EMA, patients, industry, academia were there. And particularly the ASNN is focusing on how can we you know, make that multi-stakeholder engagement blossom and, of course, at the end of the day, you know, improving drug development by academia. It's also important that when we look at the real cases, and I come back to this study that was already mentioned, Seymour from the back and team looked at, at the uh, new orphan drugs uh, approved in the 2016-2020 area, 68 products, 13 out of these were the outcome of a repurposing trajectory, and three out of four of them came from academia. So a very substantial contribution of academia to drug, drug repurposing in rare diseases. But when we look in more detail at particularly the regulatory pathways and then mapping the regulatory issues, et cetera, it's interesting to look at the, what, what we could call the regulatory HTA roadmap. And I would like to start that it is already also summarized. Another uh, slide you have seen today, but when you look at module three, so the quality in the CMC, the module four, non-clinical, module five, clinical, and of course also the post-approval safety data and also lack of efficacy. What's critical here? In, in particular, when you go over these certain products, let's start at the non-clinical. Well, most of these products were already known for more than 20 years, and there were ample data out of most of them, more than 5,000 public, publications, 10 out of 13. So a big knowledge base. And the challenge here, of course, that's also the reason this plus minus, is to translate that safety information also to the individual dossiers. But the big challenge is clinical. Small numbers, heterogeneity of patients, study design, all kinds of discussions about what, how do you measure the outcome, the endpoints, the estimate, and of course, completions of trial, and at the end of the day, the benefit-risk discussion. But we should not forget that also quality is a, maybe not at the top, but it's very critical. There were a few simple oral formulations, but there were also PEC uh, formulations, liposomals, nebulizers, compact gels, eye drops, and I think that the eye drops should not be forgotten because eye drops, people sometimes think, well, that's just an eye drop. But when I was at the CNCP, and, and Tom Debo already mentioned, we had a discussion about two dossiers uh, in, a, in a European procedure. And at the end, the CNCP voted in favor of these two eye drops. And actually, I was very surprised because I was not so impressed by the data. And then my European colleague said, you know, everything is better, you know, everything is better to have a European license than have kitchen pharmacy across Europe with very high, high variable quality and, 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 and issues here. So just to mention uh, where we can also have, a, I think, a wonderful landscape in terms of compounding in the Netherlands, that's not you know, elsewhere in, in Europe. It, 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 it varies highly differently. And then finally, I would like to highlight also the importance of uh, post-marketing data, exposure data, it's already mentioned by, by other speakers, and not to forget also the HTA pricing, where we see, particularly in these 13 products, a very bumpy HTA trajectory. Four out of 13 erratic pricing, pharmacy compounding and alternative limited access. Regulatory science aims to map you know, these kind of issues across the dossiers. Also to look at 
where can, is the applicant coming? Where are the, the hurdles? What kind of data should be you know, provided? And where is the extra you know, investment needed? The second example I would like to mention, also from recent regulatory science work, and this was more an expert meeting, more a think tanking, and Jorn Mulder and team you know, pu you know, put that all together. Investigated, initiated trials is an important academic source for building extra evidence. The question is, of course, what, what's next? You know, are we implementing this, this new evidence into the label, or we do just use it as clinicians or you know, include it in the guidelines, et cetera? And this was part of the question, you know, you know, because in the ideal phase, because that was the starting part of the discussion, it should be in the label. But new evidence, you know, it's not always you know, wanted by the different stakeholders. There can be mixed incentives for the stakeholders, marketing organizations, we have, maybe have a different view. Prescribers may say, well, it's the evidence there, I just prescribe it. The reimbursement people will say, when it's not in the label, don't reimburse it. So all kinds of mixed arguments were also exchanged and also discussed. When we use, again, the same you know, map, of course, when we look at module three and module four, it's not a big pie because the products are already on the market. That's more the easy ones, so to say. But again, module five, clinical, is again there. And there are new in, uh, indications, of course, that are important, but are these the leftovers or missed opportunities? Because uh, part of the discussion about the checkpoint inhibitors that had the initial indications in, in, in skin cancer, in, in, in lung cancer, you know, fully understandable when you look at the cell biology of these cancers. But what's next, and how will that also be implemented in, in, in new trials? And what are the trials, you know, when they, because the drug is already in the market? How do you design the trials? What are the comparisons, etc.? And of course, at the end, HTA, access, pricing, and reimbursement. Who wins, who loses, willingness to pay, and what, and what to do when the uh, industry is not want to extend the label, because that is also happening. So, these issues were also part of the discussion. And again, a mapping like this, a regulatory science looks through the lens of the different stakeholders and how to understand the reasoning why academia and industry and regulators and the clinicians may have a different perspective on the same issue. We feel that's important. So to wrap up, regulatory science provides a window of opportunity for learning for academic drug development. It's never you know, a single route. It's always, okay, that may happen, but. And this is already tried, but. And so we feel that by looking, cross-cutting through these individual dossiers, to map them in such a systematic way that you can also help other groups and also work in a more pre-competitive space because at the moment it's competitive, then there are all kinds of other issues that are on the place. And it's also important, and it is already mentioned, there are exceptions, but overall, Academia has not a very strong record of bringing promising medicinal products from the bench to the license. That's not to blame academia, but that's also a, you know, a catalyst to, to work on, on these issues and also you know, to work in, on, on the future. And just recently, and it was already mentioned by one of the other speakers, the FAST project has commissioned the RSNN and partners to develop you know, a program where we use regulatory science in such a way that it can help uh, academic drug developers also to, to go for a next step. It will be never, never, you know, at the end of the day, it will never be also a full solution, but it may always help to bring, you know, steps forward. And what we think about is in three layers. First of what we, would, what we call the very easy one, the help desk, you know, where to go, what is important, at what time, and that was already mentioned a couple of times by speakers today. The first is very much on tailoring the most suitable pathway, you know, where to go, at what moment. And the second, and you have already heard one of the examples of it, is about think tanking. How can we, looking at the system, improve individual projects? We take uh, uh, from the theory of conceptual framework of the te technology readiness levels, but that's more on the details. But the overall message here, but the overall vision here is that we try to bring regulatory science closer to academic drug development because we believe the Dutch landscape is ready to do so, also with other stakeholders and also with industry partners, patient partners to do so. To end up, critical success for us is not only the science, but also to find models of dialogue. For, and as already mentioned also in the discussion earlier today, 
how to prevent you know, the problem of liability, the problem of regulatory capture. And to close, you know, the Netherlands is not closed in, 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 in any way. It's also not closed when you look at drug development, but it's very much also important, also given that the European Medicines Agency is literally across the street that we look for inter international alignment of these activities. So having said that, I'm happy to stop here and hope for the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Bert, for your enthusiastic presentation. Well, there's time now for um, interaction here at the table, having a panel discussion. <coughs> and uh, there are, of course, questions also on the screen, chatting. But let me first start by uh, asking you, and uh, give you each some time, uh, about the presentation of uh, Clemens van Dorp. Um, what do you think of that, and does it help uh, well, what you, had, you all have your own perspective, like fast, uh, regulatory science. Um, you looked at uh, efficiency gain in the whole system. And does that help what is happening there on top? Bert, I'll start with you. Well, well I think it's very important that you know, this, this kind of dialogue and debate and development, etc., is not only between science and regulators, etc., but also that you translate that to the more political policy level, you know, ministries of health, uh, councils, uh, politicians, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, that Clemens, and, and I, I have heard that she uh, presented that in, in, in April in a bigger meeting, um, has done a wonderful job to, to make that connection. But also uh, as an ambassador to go to all the individual groups, et cetera, and, and to, to align with, okay, the EMA is here, but we have also this landscape and how to bring these two together. Um, of course, that's the theory. And the next step will be, of course, how will that be uh, you know, built further? But I think we have heard, and I'm, I'm looking also forward to the directions of the other uh, panelists, I think we have heard a lot of building blocks today also to make that happen. Yeah, okay, you think? Yeah, uh, I totally Sorry. agree. I think Clemence nicely uh, sort of communicated with the, the entire field and um, came up with uh, opportunities that arise with uh, e EMA as a sparking, uh, sparking event uh, arriving in the Netherlands. She really came up with an agenda that, that we, the challenge obviously will be in how to bring this forward. And agendas are only agendas. We need to turn this into action. And action, I think, is typically associated with some sort of money somebody has to be or be the owner of problems or action uh, steps. So I think the major challenge uh, working towards the, uh, the April uh, uh, um, meeting will be to, to decide who is taking what f uh, further and how. Uh, is there funding available? Is there who's doing this? Who's the owner? So, but a wonderful agenda and it's wonderful to have the entire field uh, coming together to, to, to sit back and, and elaborate on, on what are the challenges for the future and how can we sort of get the most from the, the good landscape that we have in the Netherlands. So okay, thanks. Jaap. Yeah, I think that people do not sufficiently realize how much we have achieved already in the Netherlands in the field of drug development, even though we hardly have big pharma here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have biotech, but mm -hmm. we don't have real big pharma. And if you look at the, I mean, I was dean, I, I had to look at those numbers of scientific achievements of individuals uh, in the field of drug development, phenomenal. The Netherlands is in the top three in the world. Uh, and in clinical research, the Netherlands, in at least in some areas of diseases, is in the top three of the world. Uh, our ac academic fundamental researchers do fantastic work. And many of the drugs, by the way, that are now in oncology originated Sorry. from Holland as a thought process. So we have a phenomenal asset there, and it's good that our government now starts to realize that we have that, and that needs support in a very consistent way. Uh, and the Netherlands is a small country. Clement said we only have 17 million inhabitants. That's a, like the greater Boston area. It's a big city in, in, the, in the rest of the world, um, but it's not a real big country. We can get anywhere within an hour almost. Uh, so collaboration is not a big problem. The only thing we should also realize that those university systems, 
the separate universities should now also acknowledge that collaboration is key in order to achieve something. Yeah, okay, clear. Um, some time to maybe to respond on each other, mm. because you heard each other's presentation and I, other things you say, well, I want to say this or that about it. Maybe not about the presentation, yeah. but just to add what, what uh, you have said, some very important things that, you know, the country and, and, and the companies, etc. I'm not so sure whether big or small is, 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 is the driver here. Uh, one of the achievements, I think, from, from the ambassador is also that she, uh, that she um, invested a lot also in the dialogue with pharma. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at the end, what we heard today is, is, of course, we want to be complementary with this kind of work to pharma, but, you know, it's a complementary means that you have also a partner somewhere. And, and, uh, and I think that that is something that, that is, is important because I remember when on the leadership of, of Yav when we, did, when, we, when we discussed that the, 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 the report that is pub just published, you know, um, and that was also my, my attitude in the, in the beginning. It said, well, this should be something that is not done by, by others, etc. So we, eh? And then we discovered how important it is, and, and again, uh, to, to align with, with pharma at, at, at the moment that are, that are relevant. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to the chat. Uh, other initiative in other countries with one expertise center where we can learn from. That's of course a uh, very interesting topic. I'm yeah. not. I'm not aware of anything like what we are now proposing, which is broad uh, throughout disease uh, areas. Um, there are a few smaller examples uh, that show that it is possible to do things like this, uh, particularly in my own field of research, oncology. In the United Kingdom, for instance, there's the Cancer Research UK, which is doing uh, drug development. Uh, they are working together with academia. They are a charity that is, is uh, raising money to do this and get some support from the government, but most of the money comes from the population. And they are front runner in the field of oncology drug development, which is amazing. A lot of their drugs, of course, they are then out licensed to pharma to, because we cannot mm -hmm really produce, the production facilities will never be available in academia. I don't think that will ever happen. Mm -hmm. But there, that's an example of how things could work. Yeah. And there's that question, are there any other real expertise centers like we have proposed in, the, in, the, in Europe? No, there are none. Uh, I was invited by the Federation of European Academies, uh, Academies of Medicine to give the same talk that I've basically given here because they are very interested uh, they are very interested to copy the whole idea, so we should move fast <laughs> in order to make sure that we're first. <laughs> should it be a European centre, maybe? Or um, should it be a national initiative? Uh, patient care is European, it's global, basically. So uh, my ideal would be let's work together in the whole world, because then it goes even faster. And if we then make sure that you work on this, and I work on that, and somebody else works on that, at least we make sure that we cover the whole... Uh, platform of diseases, because there are so many diseases where there's still an unmet medical need. Yeah. That yeah. We really, really should work together on a global scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are in the Netherlands part of uh, EATRIS, which is the European yeah. uh, 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 infrastructure for translational sciences. So, part of the I think the uh, the assignment for FAST will be to 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 build on the national hub and feed that into the European EATRIS network. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can have our our specific national sort of uh, twist to it. I think the Netherlands is well equipped. Uh, I think we have uh, good opportunities to, for closer collaboration than probably other countries are able or are willing to. Uh, we have close contacts between regulators, companies, academia uh, and government, which is, tend to be very informal uh, by nature. Uh, so we, we fancy a, a, an experiment now and then. So we well, I think we're well equipped to be front runners in attacking the major issues that everybody's obviously struggling with, but uh, to try to be pioneering the area, to really come up with innovative solutions on how to em employ public funding, uh, but how to maybe experiment with different setups like Carla today explained with a, a, an early access program and sort of try to work with insurance companies and, and, and pharmaceutical companies and government to, to find out novel ways with the ultimate goal always being getting the innovation to the patient at an affordable rate. It's some sort of accessible 
uh, well, way. I, I, and I think the, the good thing is, well, as much as we can complain about the Netherlands being so regulated, there's also a good side to that because we are highly organized. Uh, we have a high quality of, of research available. We have everything is available here at short distance. Um, we can be also the, mm. the discovery phase, basically, of what then should uh, expand into a European and maybe even global initiative. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Well, to, to add to this uh, conversation, uh, you, you see, uh, for instance, in the Copenhagen, south of Sweden uh, region, um, similar initiative, but very much public-private. Uh, and you see a similar model, in, for instance, in the Milan, so it's the north of Italy region. Um, very public private so um, you know we talk a lot you know, Boston is already mentioned that you know when you talk about Boston you talk a definition about public private because there is always a, a, a private part involved so there are also some learning from these regions from Europe I think oh, absolutely yeah. okay that's very good and I think we can also learn from the the model in Flanders of the yeah v of VIB course. so the yes. founders in Institute for biotechnology yeah. Yeah. which has a slightly different scope, but what they're doing and the setup that they have achieved is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. A question for uh, Sacco. Your party, the Netherlands, and of course we also have you, your party, Europe, <laughs> um, has been educating patients uh, to contribute to drug development. Will there be a connection made uh, with FAST? Yeah, I, there's definitely, because in the end, the uh, patient community and, and sort of the the education of patients to contribute more and better and get more involved in, in, uh, in decision making during drug development becomes more and more important. That's part of the sort of accessibility discussion that I've tried to raise. There's no point in innovations that don't reach patients or innovations that patients don't consider to be innovative. Uh, they need they need to benefit from this. So, I think uh, your party is one of those sort of um, um, education schemes that help empower patients to be engaged more in the in the uh, in this in these discussions. So, fast is by nature uh, an uh, all inclusive umbrella, if you will. Uh, you, we've seen many initiatives in Netherlands. We don't want to take away or be uh, non-inclusive. We want to link and we want to uh, get the most of the initiatives that we already have. And this is a great example mm -hmm. of a European initiative that we can feed into whoever needs it. Yeah. How can you organize that? It, well, getting, uh, knowing what's in the Netherlands is one. You know, we somehow, we sometimes forget to tell one another that what's happening in the in next door's uh, company. Uh, I've been director at, at Leiden Bioscience Park for a couple of years and sometimes one company didn't know what the company next door was doing. So mm. even, even though it's a fantastic park and there's lots of great innovation, we sometimes close the door and yeah. continue work, yeah. uh, which is fine. But we need some, maybe sometimes we need an umbrella to, to sort of uh, uh, make us aware of everything that's going on. So one is just to list, really create a searchable list of everything that's going on and, and make that available in an easy way for, for whoever is willing and, and uh, enthusiastic to, to develop n novel treatments. Yeah, okay. There, there is, there, well, the, the, but this is very important, what, what Sarko brings in, and, and particularly also um, the, the development of, of, of endpoints that are not only yeah. acceptable, but also really benefit patients. Uh, the, you know, just mentioned Leiden, but, but the, the great work of the Duchenne patient organization there to develop with the regulators, with EMA colleagues, with MIB colleagues, uh, the endpoints for clinical trials, that's, that's landmark uh, work uh, in, in the regulatory science. Yeah. I think yeah. What, what, yeah. what an organization like this could do is, uh, and we had a fantastic example in one of our expert meetings that the committee organizes, is they should be actively gathering information. Uh, we had uh, uh, an expert on, an, on disease models in our, one of our expert panels, yeah. and we had an expert on artificial intelligence. They were working at 100 kilometers mm -hmm. from each other, they didn't know each other. Mm. Yeah. And at the meeting, a chemistry was there, and now they're working together. Okay. So yeah. this is a, a good example of what a, a, a national center like this could also achieve. Get people together, yeah. get information, start looking around where people are doing yeah. what. Try to collaborate. Yeah. Right. Bert, you said um, regulatory science can bring drug development more to academia. Uh, uh, that was part of your talk. How do you see that? Well, what I, what I wanted to underpin was that, that uh, well, given all the 
you know, the, the challenge we heard today in, in virtually every talk on, the on, on academic drug development, the regulatory science is a, is a you know, in a way, a, a look through um, past developments, projects that go parallel, etc., uh, and to do cross-cutting cross analysis in such a way, and, and I showed two examples of it, but, but there are more, there's more out there, to, to help other groups also to, to you know, to, uh, actually to provide lessons learned and also to, to do's and downs. Um, I think the big challenge at the moment is, and, and, uh, and I was very pleased with some of the comments also made after Carla's uh, talk, was, you know, how, we, how do we build such a dialogue uh, uh, that is at the right moment, but also with the right people, etc. And uh, what we have learned over the last couple of years is that, that well, you can do it very protocol-based, but there should also be, uh, you know, a very... And it, that is also what I learned from, 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 the, from the FAST initiative, you know, that you should have a, you know, an open mind, okay, this is something that should be there. And you know, very often people say, well, the, the, the law should be changed, etc. cetera. But, but well, you as a chairman of the MIB knows very well, you know, the, the decisions are made by people, you know, the assessors, the, the, the people who are sitting in the board, et cetera. And, 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 you know, that, that interaction is, is critical, I think, for success. Yeah, okay. We have an, a slightly different question here uh, regarding the patient access after authorization. How does the HTA assessments differ between countries? <laughs> Why is it so that in Germany the time to market access for patients is one day compared to four years in Greece? Did Germany automate this whole process? I'm not an expert in HTA assessment, but, uh, uh, and I don't know the exact details there, but the, there are differences between EU countries. Um, and one, we are all rich, but basically one is richer than the other. We, one can afford more than the other, that's one thing. And countries do it in a different way. In Germany, for instance, the, the HTA process is basically learning by experience, uh, as far as I understand it. So after marketing authorization, doctors are allowed to prescribe the drug, which doesn't mean, by the way, that they do so. So if you talk about true patient access, the, doc the patients still don't get the drug because the doctors are not familiar with the drug, but they could get yeah. the drug. Yeah. Uh, and in other countries, they have different systems. Uh, it, you can see in that graph that I've shown you that nobody could read, that the countries that are on the bottom are usually the less wealthy countries in Europe where uh, healthcare uh, costs are even more of an issue than they are in the Netherlands, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So patient access really, had, I know from Germany the first year the drug gets on the market and they pay the price which is being asked for and after one year they look at cost effectiveness. Yeah, yeah. While in Holland we directly start we with start that. We start with that and we take some Every, and, we and it. <laughs> may take months before yeah. and the, the and, negotiations and are ready. And yeah. the UK has a slightly similar system yeah. as they have in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an extremely important issue. I've, I think the, the differences in, in all these systems uh, make great variations across Europe, which hamper sort of uh, collaboration on, on, on finding new ways because the healthcare system uh, is in the national healthcare system sort of dictates how these novel treatments are absorbed in the system, etc. But the, in the end, at the end of the day, if the system sort of postpones access f to patients, then the system doesn't optimally work. So, and for some reason, I think there are instances here where due to discussions about pricing and, and HCA and sort of what impact this innovation has for patients, the response has been by some governments and I, I, guess, I think even our own to sort of introduce a delay, delayed period for access to patients to discuss pricing, to discuss access, the true value, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's something that we need to, need to break with. We, I think we need to find new ways to, uh, we can see this coming. We can mm -hmm. see, we, we need to find ways to make this affordability issue more interconnected in the development process. Because we don't want to have the situation where in the end the patient has to wait for the innovation due to all this sort of discussion that we can, could have seen yeah. coming there or maybe have set up in a different way. Like the drug study and the drug access protocol. Exactly. To have the gap between uh, coming on the market and reimbursement. Uh, and there are now initiatives um, which are happening, well, just like you say. Mm. 
Well, I, I think it's important, and that's also where a, a, a center could help, having one national center there, uh, to be more proactive rather than reactive. Mm. We wait until the drug is, is approved by you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then we start thinking about the cost. Well, we should do that before you even see the, the dossier uh, and yeah. think about what's the, what the consequences are going to be. Somebody today mentioned the cell therapies which are promising in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But if the costs are as they, if the costs stay as they are now, it is predictable that this will be unaffordable. And mm -hmm. cost is talking about affordable. That's what the A stands for, and sustainable. So, yeah. if, so the, yeah. if the future is going to be looking like it looks now, it's going to be unaffordable and unsustainable. Mm. Yeah, maybe the, um, uh, at this moment we have what we call a parallel procedure, so that the HTA organization in the SIN yeah. already looks at do their assessment while we are still. Uh, pre-marketing assessment doing. And uh, I, I think we show that um, the reimbursement is three months uh, faster than mm -hmm. uh, starting after it, it's on the market. So there are also there initiatives that you have a parallel procedure of assessment, which can really help, of course. Oh, absolutely. And if you have the, the, the scientific advice together already from the start, and you know uh, what the questions are from the HCA organization, and you have a parallel procedure that's helpful. So well, I think there are all kinds of things mm. going on. It certainly helps. We had a fantastic uh, uh, discussion last week in, at a conference that I joined um, because you as CBG are looking at a set of data and you're looking at the benefit risk ratio, basically. The HTA are looking at some other perspectives, yeah. which are also economical, which are not covered in our clinical trial design. Yeah. So the question is, can we design studies mm -hmm. that basically are sufficient for your purposes with the yeah. data that we provide, but at the same time are sufficient for the purposes of HTA that look at yeah. basically the same dossier, but in another way. Yeah. If we can achieve that yeah. by changing our trial design, we satisfy everybody, so why not do it? Yeah, we have PhD students, uh, Rick Freeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, timing has been mentioned a couple of times today, and, and, and I think uh, the big message from, from this discussion is keep investing as MIB in parallel advice, because that's, that's, that's very important. But coming back to the development of FAST and other initiatives, etc., and, and early scientific advice, actually, that early scientific advice is kind of a window of what could be coming, you know, and it's like the horizon scanning, but then in a different way. And, and use that opportunity so that you know, okay, what when scientific advice in this year is already going on that direction, that kind of disease, etc., so that the HCA environment is also prepared of what's coming maybe in two, three, five, or six years, etc. Uh, and very often, as, as Sarko said, when the dossier is there, maybe you're too late because then you look at, it, at, the, at, the, at the clinical evidence and say, well, I want to have a different dose or a different comparison or a different whatever. Yeah. Well, then you're too late. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. We have a question for Jaap. Uh, you mentioned that improved interaction between academia, industry, regulators, agencies is needed. Can you share your thoughts on how to achieve this? And for example, stimulate exchange or even bundling of personnel, knowledge, science, and experience? Bundling of personnel <laughs> maybe one st station too far, I guess. Um, what is important is that we get to know each other because uh, we're all having the same aims, that we understand each other, and, and somebody was saying, speak each other's language, so that's going to be important. Um, and bring the people together achieves that already. Uh, and we've seen fantastic uh, examples of how CBG here is helping the academics to understand regulatory issues. Um, so as long as we can achieve that we really get together somehow, and if we have a training of people that are interested in this field of drug development, and they could go to regulatory, they could to go to industry, they could go to academia, or they become patient advocates, and they could then exchange even in their further career their jobs, in an easy way, that would be fantastic, of course. That's why education is so prominent on our recommendation. It may not be prominent on the slide because the, the font was small, but it's really prominent in the, in the recommendation. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, is having a center of excellence which coordinates enough in the scattered landscape or should it be centralized more? That's again, I think for you, Jaap. Well, Sako could answer part of Or for it. Sako, well, yeah. Well, I think, Sako. Yeah, well, it's, it's part of what could help. Uh, the center of excellence is, I would say, the infrastructure and sort of the gateway and helping everybody who's doing this by 
uh, making a uh, by um, attaching this to public funding and coordinating public funding. This is a much more centralized tool because in the end, what we fund is what's happening. Uh, so I think that's important that we should stay away from all these all these centers who are have some sort of excellence because uh, in the end we have a country full of centers of excellence. But we need to coordinate public funding accordingly to match the ideas of a central uh, uh, center of expertise. So funding here, I think, is a key element that we need to um, coordinate, but also to essentially we first need to um, get it because it's uh, tough times to get new public funding uh, available. Uh, National Growth Fund is, uh, is one of those sort of large opportunities that we are, uh, that a couple of, of proposals are in our area. Uh, Farmanel is one of the most sort of directly linked to uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, so let's hope that sort of follows through because that would shape the, the landscape for the coming years, I think. So funding is a key element. And, and here I think that we can take the example of the, the Belgian experience with the Flanders Institute for Biotechnology mm -hmm. where the government invested a considerable amount of money. But in 10 years time, that machinery that was developed yes. got to be self-supporting. Yeah. So, and that's the ideal that you would like to achieve, of course. Are there are more examples. In, yeah. in, in a collaborative way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're, um, we're getting close to the end. And so I'm looking at our panelists, um, whether they still want to give a message here. Um, we want to strengthen drug development in academia. You yeah. have, okay. yeah, Bert, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, that when I take one thing out of you know, the whole discussion today, and I think uh, um, we will have a uh, discussion also after Peter Moll's uh, uh, presentation, but uh, I think that um, uh, collaboration is key. Uh, look for the, the st multi stakeholder, including public private. But also, um, you know, that the MRB is also uh, enabled to continue to invest in regulatory science because, uh, you know, there is always t a pressure on funding, on, on, on budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And also to co convince, uh, you know, your, the political leaders also that is, this is not a hobby of no. you know, some scientists, but this is, this is really... If you really care for Dutch patients, you should, you know, be top regulatory science because then you can also add to these initiatives uh, pro proposed by the by the by the committee and proposed by by Fast. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think the the key word here is collaboration, yeah. uh, mutual trust, um, and uh, an understanding at the government that you can't get this done for one million euros or something like that. Uh, and then I think the key is, let's just do it. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. <laughs> Saka, you're close to funding, I think, with yeah. contact with ministries. Yes, what well, is working on it, working <laughs> on it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, funding, obviously, like I, I stated before, uh, funding is a key element yeah. to get things done. And uh, we, this discussion um, and the reports and initiatives, I think, greatly help in, in stipulating the importance of, of public funding in this area. And I think... Uh, uh, I would also like to sort of challenge the the viewers and the, and everybody in the Netherlands to be disruptive in in approaches that tackle main issues because we can make we can try to pioneer really as a forefront country uh, with all the elements and initiatives that we have and we don't have to fund pub we don't have to publicly fund an, a, a, an academic pipeline. Uh, I don't think that's the way forward. Uh, the way forward would be to experiment and to be disruptive in novel approaches into getting innovations to patients, because that's what we're in for. Yeah. Um, so really be innovative in your approach as well, because that's yeah. what sets us apart, I think. We have a new government, and uh, I did not look at the program <laughs> in total. Uh, do you think there is enough uh, attention for well, what we are now talking about for the coming four years? Um, not as much as I, I thought when the election, in the election time everybody was talking about drugs and, and, yeah. uh, and sort of getting back uh, sort of more COVID. national uh, <laughs> yeah. COVID uh, <laughs> sparked the discussion. So 
in the end, pandemic preparedness is a big issue, obviously. Uh, it's uh, the lessons learned from COVID uh, and the sort of idea of getting more uh, well-established uh, production facilities in the Netherlands as well. To, that's new. Okay, <laughs> what's happening <laughs> here? Boring, uh, Some kind of music. <laughs> um, so I think it's increasing. Um, but we we have a long way to go to to, to actually get it, uh, and I think these discussions from for, from today really help in to articulate where what the potency in the Netherlands is. And okay, let's hope politicians looked at this uh, science day. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much, uh, these panelists. Uh, I think we had an interesting discussion, and uh, I hope uh, also uh, at home you could follow that or at your work. Uh, and uh, we have a wrap up. And the wrap-up is by uh, Peter Moll. He will give reflections on this afternoon. Uh, Peter Moll, he is uh, uh, a professor of drug regulatory science at the University Medical Center in Groningen. But he is also a senior clinical assessor at the MEB and vice chair of the Scientific Advice Working Party at the European Medicines AC. And he is very busy, I know, with all the scientific advices uh, also at the European level, in which also the MEB is involved. Um, Peter, the floor is yours for the reflection of the day. Thank you. So thank you, Ton. And indeed, um, uh, reflections on a day like this is always difficult. Uh, ten minutes uh, we have. Um, I think importantly, uh, I heard our director of the CBG uh, MEB say, um, this is important. Uh, and we should really stimulate, uh, facilitate academic drug development. And I think that is really key. So I would like to, to have a reflection on the word cloud, the first word, word cloud that was here, and that identified reasons why it was so difficult for academic developers to think beyond, well, the publication of their paper, uh, which also makes that, that the projects are often having short timelines to, okay, we have an idea, we have some funding, we want to work on this, and then to figure in how, how does this align with what regulators expect, which guidelines to follow, which guidelines do exist, actually. And so there are important knowledge gaps that make it not so straightforward how to get there. And I think then I wanted to go to what we heard and learned in this afternoon. Uh, Victoria Staroskosko, always having difficulties pronouncing your name, Vika, but you really give this fantastic overview of this, this big STARS project, a project where about two-thirds of all European regulators, yes, there are 27 national competent authorities actually in Europe, working collaboratively with the EMA on trying to get medicines approved, but also giving guidance on how you want to develop medicines. And in the STARS project, you really showed that it is so important that regulators talk with academia and, and try to understand where they need to provide information on regulatory science. What do you need to do? And actually, in that pro project, there were many of, of these surveys performed, actually four surveys performed, trying to identify what is going on in academia, what are uh, regulators offering in, in support of, of, of drug development programs. And a lot of piloting work was done also. And I think one of the key conclusions that we drew from that project, or are still drawing because it's, it's nearing its completion, is that it is so very important, I want to say some bad word there, but so key to that, that, that you communicate well. The language that we are using as regulators, yes, English, we all can speak in a certain way, and we have the European English, which is fine, but it is also important that we explain our jargon. And not just the jargon, the, the, the difficult abbreviations, but especially also that aspect on, okay, what do you mean by should uh, uh, investigate this or shall investigate this or you should consider this primary endpoint or not. And I think that is really something that is important and awareness within the academia world can be improved through a project that's trying to reach out so much. But many steps will have to be followed, and I think national competent authorities, so the national regulators, have to take this on board. Um, Marion uh, was then talking about 
the scientific advice uh, procedures. And yes, um, I'm, I'm working there, as Ton said. Uh, we have about 700 a year and 10% growth every year. And that means that I'm going to a conference every month where 70 to 100 drug development programs are being discussed. Not just drug development programs, but also kind of new things like uh, uh, watch and wearables that you can use to, to measure outcomes. Maybe much more of interest than the six-minute walk to find if a patient can move about. But also something that uh, needs to be reflected upon uh, by regulators and understood if you want to apply that in a drug development program as a valuable endpoint. I think Teun uh, van Gelder then really came from Leiden, where Boston at the North Sea, uh, as, as they call it, is really onto it. How do we want to stimulate academic drug development? And I think uh, Leiden has, has an important uh, uh, development here and a lot of uh, impetus on how to do that. Also very visible across the Netherlands, and I think it's important, as, as Teun also acknowledged, that we really need to talk with other academic centers and that it should be also clear where academics should maybe focus on. Yes, we were talking a lot about repurposing, but also that maybe in the field of, of academic research you're looking at these more uh, kind of technical uh, drugs, the more uh, advanced um, molecules that can be made locally and really apply to individual patients. And so it's not so much on the generics or the Me Too de developments. And I think they, uh, Leiden uh, really helps in understanding what needs to be done. The Dutch MEB is reaching out, is, is, is participating in many of the programs. So I think we are there also on board from, from the regulatory side. And I think um, for the years to come, this will be an important way of collaborating also with the other academic uh, centers. Carla um, is then always great from the perspective of um, um, having these rare and ultra-rare diseases, somebody who is treating patients, uh, but also uh, in areas where hitherto there was nothing. You had to work with old compounds. But in the meantime, by better understanding of these, uh, let's say, complex diseases, there is a possibility of to find the right drugs. And you see that there is lots ongoing and an important uh, activity she's employing, but also many others in that field, and where I'm really interested in as a regulator, is that we understand the disease history better by capturing data in what we call patient registries, so that we really can investigate what drugs do also in long term, as she said, on effectiveness uh, outside of what is done in the trials of, of companies. And these, these registries should be owned, I think, by, by the investigators or by the patients, uh, supported by national initiatives or European initiatives if we, or global initiatives, actually, if you're looking at these ultra-rare diseases, because just in the Netherlands alone would not suffice. But an important new source also of data, what she was talking of. Then it's fine if you generate information on drugs and if you investigate them, but also, indeed, I think we paid some attention today to it's not just having the knowledge of how the drug works, approving them, but also that patients have access to them. So pricing and the next steps on, on reimbursement is obviously clearly something that would be important to, to address. I think um, after the break, Clemens and, and, and Sarko um, really gave that, that view on, okay, what can we do as a develop an, an environment in the Netherlands to stimulate academic drug development? And I think the fast... Uh, uh, program is really something that obviously is something that is really hopefully creating that stimulating drug development environment. Um, clearly, after the pandemic, nothing will become the same. Next week, we take off our uh, face masks, but we hope not to do that too often in the future again. And we want that to be limited to uh, surg the, the surgery. But I think uh, for that, he also made a very clear statement that infectious diseases will be something we will have to focus on in the future. Uh, Jaap Verwey um, has worked in, uh, with uh, a very interesting approach on, on the KNW, the, the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences, where they really try to see, okay, so we do fantastic things in the Netherlands. We have these fantastic organoids on chips, which make our targeted therapies so fantastic that we can really identify the right patient for that right drug. And we, we, we can 
uh, perform studies that, that haven't done, been done before. We need, again, different types of data sometimes because we are getting into very narrow populations. We, we need to understand how can we broadly have our new, uh, for instance, these organon chips adopted as, as a means of, of identifying patients, maybe foregoing some of the, the, the um, animal experiments that might be um, um, just performed with these kind of um, organoids and the question therefore is that he said or one of the solutions he said is there should be this national kind of institute that that really facilitates all the knowledge or brings the knowledge together and i think that was one of the aspects that really came through today i think then um, uh, clearly um, the one that closed that that present set of presentations was well we couldn't do this kind of days without bert leukens he was my mentor when I did ph pharmacy in Utrecht many years ago. He is still, I think, the eminence Greece in the field of regulatory science, and he will hopefully, for years to come, help us in, in advancing what regulators can learn from the field uh, of academic drug development, but also um, how vice versa um, better standards can be implemented. So I think the think tank regulatory science Netherlands is something that he re or what he really established and where it's so important that regulators and industry, uh, but also other parties, uh, have a safe haven to come together and talk about beyond their borders, so with academics and, and other uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, I think clearly also in his presentation, um, new evidence into the label coming from independent studies, not from industry, are important. So I think with that, we have a very nice round of, of input. Um, I, I wanted to close with uh, the, the, the students, and I haven't forgotten them, because I really think that Brit, Peter, Doreen, Sonia and Nafisa are the future. They are regulators, or partly regulators, or very closely affiliated to regulators, but looking at how the regulators function. They were also a little more diverse than we uh, grey men uh, sitting around the table here talking about the future, and I think the future looks bright with these kind of interesting studies done, very hands-on, and also giving us insight in, okay, how can these regulatory processes in, in part be improved? How can new tools be adopted in uh, um, approving and understanding drug effects? So I think with that, there is this final word cloud that uh, regulators can do to facilitate drug development. I think we discussed many of these especially the outreach of, of the agency uh, towards, in the, uh, towards the academic setting is, I think, something that needs to be done a lot. We do that in, in forms of trainings, and we also that office in academia, I think, is something that uh, in these times of virtual, because that is an advantage, I think, we have learned of the pandemic, that we can use virtual also in, in more senses, will be something that helps us. But I think also organized workshops, masterclasses perhaps around topics would be really great. And, and Ton de Boer is, is giving a masterclass with uh, a couple of, of uh, master students in, in the near future. So I think you can still all uh, apply for that. So with that, I think I'd like to give the word back to, to Ton to wrap it up. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for uh, your uh, reflections of this afternoon. It, I think it was quite difficult, but you did very well. And, uh, and very good that you ended with the PhD students, uh, which we haven't seen uh, ourselves, but they were there and they are very important. We supervise them also, so that, that's, that's very good. Um, I want to thank all the speakers, um, which are on the table, but also, of course, in the first part of the program. Uh, the time management was very good because we're <laughs> exactly ending uh, where we wanted to end. I think that's uh, important. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving all the thoughts. And uh, I want also um, thank the participants, which we have not seen, but uh, we have seen you in the chat. Thank you for your questions. They were very relevant and, and that we learned that you were listening and asked questions. That's very good. Um, uh, also, I want to um, thank, of course, the organizers of this program, especially, of course, Marion and Sietzke. Uh, they did quite some work to make this all happen, and I think we really had a wonderful afternoon. I was very glad uh, with this subject. I think it's very timely and uh, perfect. Uh, so that's, um, uh, well, 
I want to thank uh, the, the speakers and organizers and the participants. Uh, for the participants, it's still possible uh, to meet, meet the PhD students because they're face-to-face. Uh, um, -face. You have to go to the platform networking and they're there and you can ask your question and, and see them uh, in, in real. I think that's important and uh, again, thank the PhD students also for what they did. And uh, I saw um, during that there were a lot of chat questions which uh, could be answered, so that's uh, very good. Um, to finish now, this recording will be made available uh, at least for one month, so you can look back uh, uh, after this meeting what happened here. And uh, I think uh, we should give an applause. It is a little bit strange. Normally you have a big uh, room, but thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>